Esoteric Psychology, Volume 1. A Treatise on the Seven Rays, Volume 1. Matter is the vehicle for the manifestation of soul on this plane of existence, and soul is the vehicle on a higher plane for the manifestation of spirit, and these three are a trinity synthesized by life, which pervades them all. The Secret Doctrine, Volume I, page 80, Third Edition. Forward. Page XVII. The question arises. Each time a book is written which is to be read by earnest aspirants, what line of instruction will carry forward their training with the most speed? For speed is an essential factor, if the present-day unfoldment is to be rightly utilized and the stress and strain in the world relieved. The teaching to be given must likewise increase their mental competency, and lead to that stabilization of the emotional body which will most rapidly set them free for service. It must be remembered that constant study, of papers, and the apprehension by the ear and eye of statements anent the ageless wisdom, serve only to increase responsibility, or produce brain fatigue and soreness, with subsequent revolt from instruction. Only that which is brought into use in the life is of practical value and retains its livingness. Sincerity is the first thing for which those of us who teach inevitably look. Let me remind those I reach through these books that the main result I look for is one of group cooperation and understanding, and not that of individual benefit. By studying and reading with care, a group interplay is set up. The group becomes more closely integrated, the units in it more closely linked together and as a group more closely blended in the unfolding plan of the treat ones. We are building and planning for the future and for humanity, and not for the personal unfoldment of any particular aspirant. The individual growth is of no tremendous significance. The formation and development of a band of pledged aspirants, trained to work together and to respond in unison to a teaching, is of real moment, page XVIII. To those of us who are responsible for the training and for the preparation of the group of world disciples who will function with freedom and power in a later cycle. You see a tiny portion of the plan. We see the plan as it unfolds for a series of lives ahead. And we are today seeking those who can be taught to work in group formation and who can constitute one of the active units in the vast happenings that lie ahead, connected with that two-thirds of humanity who will stand upon the path at the close of the age, and with that one-third who will be held over for later unfoldment. We are training men and women everywhere so that they can be sensitive to the plan, sensitive to their group vibration, and thus able to cooperate intelligently with the unfolding purpose. It is a mistake to think that the plan is to train aspirants to be sensitive to the vibration of a master or to the hierarchy. That is but incidental and of minor importance. It is for the purpose of training aspirants so that group awareness may be developed that these books have been written. Recognize clearly that you personally do not count, but that the group most surely does. Teaching is not given only in order to train you or to provide you with opportunity. All life is opportunity, and individual reaction to opportunity is one of the factors which indicate soul growth. For this, the training school of the world itself suffices. There should be an all impartation of truth no imposition of authority. Aspirants must be left free to avail themselves of the teaching or not, and spiritual work must go forward because of the free choice and self-initiated effort of the individual student. In the books already published three basic lines of teaching can be traced. First, a relatively new technique has been given as to the control of the body. Second, teaching has been given anent the formation of the new group of world servers. Third, the general lines of the magical work of creation have received attention. The first line of teaching concerns the individual and his development. The second indicates the nature and ideals of the group into which he may find his way if he profits by the teaching and learns control. The third, could you but realize it, details in some measure the methods and modes of work during the coming new age. Ponder upon these three main approaches to truth, and think upon them with clarity of thought. Mental appreciation of their significance will produce understanding and will likewise increase the group apprehension of the teaching which I have sought to impart. Any student who thinks clearly and applies the teaching to his daily life is contributing most valuably to the group awareness. Often aspirant says to himself, Of what real use am I? How can I, in my small sphere, 
be of service to the world? Let me reply to these questions by pointing out that by thinking this book into the minds of the public, by expressing before your fellow men the teaching it imparts, and by a life lived in conforming with its teaching, your service is very real. This will necessarily involve a pledging of the entire personality to the helping of humanity, and the promise to the higher self that endeavor will be made to lose sight of self in service, a service to be rendered in the place and under the circumstances which a man's destiny and duty have imposed upon him. I mean a renewal of the effort to bring about the purification of all the bodies so that the entire lower man may be a pure channel and instrument through which spiritual force may flow unimpeded. I mean the attaining of an attitude wherein the aspirant desires nothing for the separated self, and in which he regards all that he has as something which he can lay upon the altar of sacrifice for the aiding of his brethren. Could all who read this book see the results of such a united effort, there would emerge a group activity, intelligently undertaken, which would achieve great things. So many people run hither and thither after this individual or that, or this piece of work or that, and, working with lack of intelligent coordination, achieve nothing and no group results. But united group effort would eventuate in an inspired reorganization of the entire world, and the elimination of hindrances. There would be the making of real sacrifices and the giving up of personal wishes and desires in order that group purposes may be served. Above all, there must be the elimination of fear. With this I have dealt at length in a treatise on white magic, and have given likewise certain rules and formulas for its control. How many who have read the teaching profited by the information imparted? Will you not, with determination and because the world cries out for help, cast away fear and go forward with joy and courage into the future? There has been, behind all the books which I have written, a definite purpose and a planned sequence of teaching. It may be of interest to you if I trace them for you. The first book issued was Initiation, Human and Solar. This book was intended for the average aspirant, to lead him on from where he was to a vision of an organized band of teachers who were seeking to aid humanity, and incidentally himself, and to give some idea of their technique of work and modes of procedure. Letters on occult meditation indicated how these teachers could be reached and the discipline of life that the treading of the path involved. These two are especially for aspirants. A treatise on cosmic fire is in an entirely different category. In the last analysis, it is for the guidance of the initiates of the world, and will lift the aspirant's eyes away from himself and his own growth to a vaster conception and a universal ideal. The mark of the initiate is his lack of interest in himself, in his own unfoldment and his own personal fate, and all aspirants who become accepted disciples have to master the technique of disinterestedness. Their eyes have also to be lifted away from the group of workers and from the hierarchy which they constitute and to be fixed on wider horizons and vaster realms of activity. They great creative plan, its laws and technique of unfoldment, and the work of the builders of the universe was dealt with. Emerging out of the mass of imparted facts, and underlying all the teaching, was the idea of a great life with its own psychology and ideas. It was an attempt to give a synthetic picture of the unfolding mind of God as it works out its plans through the lesser sons of mind. In symbolism and archaic phrases it veiled the truths and principles which lie at the root of the creative process, and in its entirety is beyond the grasp of the advanced student. At the same time, it is a most valuable compendium of information, and will serve to convey truth and to develop the intuition. The last book, A Treatise on White Magic, is a parallel volume to a treatise on cosmic fire. Just as the first dealt with the psychology of deity, the work of the macrocosm, and the laws whereby the solar logos works, so this book constitutes a treatise on the psychology of the Son of God and the work of the microcosm. It intimately concerns his place in the larger whole. I have also aided A.A.B. in getting out a translation of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which is a bridging book, intended to show the aspirant the rules whereby the light within him may be developed and the power of the intuition be brought to bear on all problems and on the Phenomena of Life Itself. This book was given the name The Light on the Soul. Here I am fulfilling my intention to write a book on the subject of the seven rays. This topic has always been of real interest for students, but about these rays little is known. We know, from the secret doctrine, that they are the building forces and the sum total of all that is in the manifested universe, 
but their effect in the human kingdom, and their essential quality and nature, remain as yet a mystery. It will be necessary for me to avoid the cosmic note, if I may so call it, for I seek to make the information of practical value to the student and to the intelligent reader. I shall therefore approach the subject entirely from the standpoint of the human family and deal with the subject in terms of psychological values, laying the foundation for that new psychology which is much needed, and so dealing primarily with the human equation. What I have to say will be a commentary upon an expansion of the words found in the proem of the secret doctrine, that all souls are one with the oversoul. We shall, from the outset, accept the fact of the soul. We shall not consider the arguments for or against the hypothesis of there being a soul universal, cosmic, and divine, or individual and human. For our purposes of discussion, the soul exists, and its intrinsic reality is assumed, as a basic and proven principle. Those who do not admit this assumption can, however, study the book from the angle of a temporarily accepted hypothesis, and thus seek to gather those analogies and indications which may substantiate the point of view. To the aspirant, and to those who are seeking to demonstrate the existence of the soul because they believe in its existence, this expression of its laws and tradition, its nature, origin and potentialities will become a gradually deepening and experienced phenomenon. What I indicate and the suggestions I may make, will, I forecast, be demonstrated, in the scientific sense, during the coming Aquarian age. Science will then have penetrated a little further into the field of intangible yet real phenomena. It will have discovered mayhap it has already made this discovery. That the dense and concrete do not exist. It will know that there is but one substance, present in nature in varying degrees of density and of vibratory activity, and that this substance is impelled by urgent purpose and expressive of divine intent. We shall seek to avoid as far as possible those loose generalities which are so distressing to the academic and critical mind, and in which the mystic finds such relief and joy. I will however ask those who study this treatise to reserve their opinion and come to no crystallized judgment until the entire proposition has been presented to them, and its outlines have been clearly sensed and its details somewhat elaborated. It will be necessary for us to introduce the subject on a wide basis and to link the individual with the general, and this may, at the first, seem too vast a theme, too speculative a presentation and too misty and vague an outline. But this situation cannot be avoided, for the argument, as must be the case in all truly occult work must be considered from the universal to the particular, from the cosmic to the individual. Men are, as yet, too interested in the particular and the individual to find it easy to apply the same interest to the greater whole in which they live and move and have their being, nor do they at this time, as a general rule, possess that inner mechanism of thought and that intuitive perception of truth which will enable them easily to grasp the significance of that which underlies the symbolism of words, or to see clearly the subjective outline under the objective form. But the effort to understand carries its own reward and the attempt to grasp and comprehend the soul cosmic, universal, planetary and individual leads inevitably to an unfoldment of the mental apparatus, with a subsequent development of the, as yet, quiescent brain cells, which must eventually produce a coordination of the thinking faculty, and resultant illumination. The nature of our septenary universe must be considered, and the relation of the threefold human being to the divine trinity must be noted. A general idea of the entire symbolic picture is of value. Each student, as he takes up the study of the rays, must steadily bear in mind that he himself as a human unit finds his place on one or other of these rays. The problem thus produced is a very real one. The physical body may be responsive to one type of ray force, whilst the personality as a whole may vibrate in unison with another. The ego or soul may find itself upon still a third type of ray thus responding to another type of ray energy. The question of the monotic ray brings in still another factor in many cases, but this can only be implied and not really elucidated. As I have oft told you, it is only the initiate of the third initiation who can come in touch with his monotic ray, or his highest life aspect, and the humble aspirant cannot as yet ascertain whether he is a monad of power, of love or of intelligent activity. In concluding, I ask for your sincere cooperation in the work which we are undertaking. 
It may be of more general and public value than any other of my writings. I shall seek to make this treatise upon the soul relatively brief. I shall seek to express these abstract truths in such a way that the general public, with its profound interest in the soul, may be intrigued and won to a deeper consideration of what is as yet a veiled surmise. The Aquarian age will see the fact of the soul demonstrated. This is an attempt, carried forward in the difficulties of a transition period which lacks even the needed terminology, to aid that demonstration. Let me also add that your attitude to the imparted instruction should be that of the student who is seeking truth that can be verified and information that can be applied to the daily life and tested in the crucible of life experience. If, for instance, there are indeed seven rays, embodying seven types of divine energy, then a man should be able to recognize these types and energies in the particular field of phenomena in which he plays his little part. If the truth given is veiled in symbolism and offered as an hypothesis, it should at the same time be unveiled sufficiently so as to be recognizable, and should have in it if sufficient intelligent appeal to warrant its investigation. The words, all souls are one with the oversoul, may and do, I believe, embody a basic and essential piece of information, but unless there is evidence in the world that there is appearing a living relation between all sentient beings, then the statement is meaningless. The fact is that universal sentiency and a general awareness are recognized everywhere as existing and as developing. The world is full of knowledge, which is in the last analysis sentient response to conditions which exist, by minds which are developing but are not fully developed. It is becoming gradually apparent that under diversity lies a basic unity, and that our awareness is right and true and correct in so far as we can identify ourselves with this unity. In closing, may I beg all of you to go forward. Let nothing in the past, physical inertia, mental depression, lack of emotional control, keep you from taking fresh hold and with joy and interest making that needed progress which will fit you for more active and useful service. That none of you may be hindered by the past or by the present, but may live as onlookers, is the prayer, constant and believing, of your teacher. The Tibetan. I Introductory Remarks. 1. The three objectives in studying the rays. 2. Definition of the words, life quality appearance. 3. The seven rays enumerated. 4. The function of Christianity. Chapter I. Introductory Remarks. I. The three objectives in studying the rays. The study of the rays, and a true and deep comprehension of the inner significance of the teaching, will do for us three things. Oh, it will throw much light upon the times and cycles in the unfolding panorama of history. In the last analysis, history is an account of the growth and development of man from the stage of the caveman, with his consciousness centered in his animal life, up to the present time wherein the human consciousness is steadily becoming more inclusive and mental, and so on and up to the stage of a perfected son of God. It is an account of the apprehension, by man, of the creative ideas which have molded the race and are establishing its destiny. It gives us a dramatic picture of the progress of those souls who are carried in or out of manifestation by the appearance or disappearance of a ray. We shall find, as we study, that words will greatly handicap our expression of the realities involved, and we must endeavor to penetrate beneath the surface meaning to the esoteric structure of truth. These rays are in constant movement and circulation, and demonstrate an activity which is progressive and cyclic and evidences increasing momentum. They are dominant at one time and quiescent at another, and according to the particular ray which is making its presence felt at any particular time, so will be the quality of the civilization, the type of forms which will make their appearance in the kingdoms of nature, and the consequent stage of awareness, the state of consciousness, of the human beings who are carried into form life in that particular era. These embodied lives, again in all four kingdoms, will be responsive to the peculiar vibration, quality, coloring and nature of the ray in question. The ray in manifestation will affect potently the three bodies which constitute the personality of man, and the influence of the ray will produce changes in the mind content and the emotional nature of the man and determine the caliber of the physical body. I am aware, therefore, that in giving out this relatively new teaching upon the rays I may, 
in my endeavor to shed fresh light, temporarily increase the complexity of the subject. But as experiment is made, as people are studied in the laboratories of the psychologists and the psychoanalyst in connection with their ray indications, and as the newer sciences come into wise use in their proper sphere, we shall gain much and the teaching will find corroboration. We shall see emerging a new approach to the ancient truths, and a new mode of investigating humanity. In the meantime let us concentrate upon the clear enunciation of the truth anent the rays, and seek to tabulate, outline and indicate their nature, purpose and effects. The seven rays, being cyclic in appearance, have continuously passed in and out of manifestation and have thus left their mark down the ages upon mankind, and therefore hold the clue to any true historical survey. Such a survey still remains to be made. B. A. second result of the study of the rays will be to clarify our knowledge as to the nature of man. Modern psychology, experimental and academic, has done much to gather information as to how a man functions, what is the nature of his reactions, the caliber of his thought apparatus and the quality of his physical mechanism, the mode of his thinking and the sum total of complexes, psychoses, neuroses, instincts, intuitions and intellectual fixations which he undoubtedly is. Medical psychology has also given us much, and we have learnt that the human being is entirely conditioned by his instrument of expression and can express no more than his nervous system, brain and glands permit. We find, however, that some of the theories, even the best proven, break down, given varying conditions. The field covered by psychology today is so vast, its schools so many and varied, and its terminology so cumbersome, that I can make no attempt to deal with it here. The indebtedness of the world to the trained psychologists cannot be estimated, but unless there is a key idea interjected into the whole field of thought, it will fall of its own weight, and produce. As it is already producing, problems, complexes and diseases of the mind which are direct results of its own methods. The knowledge we now have of how men work on the physical plane as integrated personalities, and of how they can be expected to work, given certain conditions, is broad and sound, and the wideness of its grasp can be somewhat gauged if we compare what we know today with what was known a hundred and fifty years ago. But it has been largely based upon a study of the abnormal, and upon the form aspect, this latter being the true scientific method, and is therefore limited and circumscribed when it is put to the test in the last analysis and in the light of the undoubtedly existent supernormal. What I seek to do, and the contribution I seek to make to the subject, have to do with the emphasis we shall lay upon the nature of the integrating principle found within all coherent forms and on that which can, for lack of a better word, be called the soul or self. This principle, which informs the body nature and expresses its reactions through the emotional and mental states, is of course recognized by many schools of psychology, but remains nevertheless an unknown and undefinable quantity. They find it impossible to discover its origin. They know not what it is, whether or no it is an informing entity, detached and separate from the body nature. They question whether it is an integrated energetic sum total brought into existence through the fusion of the body cells, and therefore, through the process of evolution, constituting a thinking, feeling entity, or whether it is no more than the aggregated life and consciousness of the cells themselves. The above is a generalization which will serve our purpose and will cover the general proposition. It will appear, as we study, that the energies which inform the personalities and which constitute the nature of the human being fall naturally into three groups. 1. Those energies which we call, the spirits in men. You note here the utter superficiality of that phrase. It is meaningless and misleading. Spirit is one, but within that essential unity the points of fire, or, the divine sparks, can be seen and noted. These unities, within the unity, are colored by and react qualitatively to three types of energy, for it is scientifically true, and a spiritual fact in nature, that God is the three in one and the one in three. The spirit of man came into incarnation along a line of force emanation from one or other of these three streams, which form one stream, emanating from the Most High. Two. These streams of energy differentiate into a major three, yet remain one stream. This is an occult fact worthy of the deepest meditation. 
In their turn they differentiate into seven streams which, carry into the light, as it is called, the seven types of souls. It is with these seven that we shall deal. 3. The energies into which the three distribute themselves, thus becoming seven, in their turn produce the forty-nine types of force which express themselves through all the forms in the three worlds and the four kingdoms in nature. You have therefore a. Three monadic groups of energies. The essential unity expresses, through these three, the qualities of will, love and intelligence. b. Seven groups of energies which are the medium through which the three major groups express the divine qualities. c. 49 groups of forces to which all forms respond and which constitute the body of expression for the seven, who in their turn are reflections of the three divine qualities. In some mysterious ways, therefore, the differentiations which manifest in nature are found in the realm of quality and not in the realm of reality. It is with the seven groups of souls, or soul energies, that we shall deal, and with the threefold forms in the fourth kingdom of nature which they create, and through which they have to express the quality of their ray group and the energy of that one of the three essential groups to which their soul ray is related. We shall therefore, if possible, endeavor to add to modern psychology and enrich its content with that esoteric psychology which deals with the soul or self, the ensouling entity within the form. See the third effect of the study of these rays should be twofold. Not only shall we understand somewhat the inner side of history, not only shall we gain an idea of the divine qualities emerging from the three aspects and determining the forms of expression on the physical plane, but we shall have a practical method of analysis whereby we can arrive at a right understanding of ourselves as ensouling entities, and at a wiser comprehension of our fellowmen. When, through our study, we ascertain for instance that the tendency of our soul ray is that of will or power, but that the ray governing the personality is that of devotion, we can more truly gauge our opportunity, our capacities and our limitations. We can more justly determine our vocation and service, our assets and our debits, our true value and strength. When we can add to that knowledge and analysis which enables us to realize that the physical body is reacting preeminently to the soul ray, whilst the emotional body is under the influence of the personality ray which is historically in manifestation at the time, we are then in a position to gauge our particular problem with judgment. We can then deal more intelligently with ourselves, with our children and with our friends and associates. We shall find ourselves able to cooperate more wisely with the plan as it is seeking expression at any particular time. It is a platitude to say that the true meaning of psychology is the word of the soul. It is the sound, producing an effect in matter, which a particular ray may make. This is in some ways a difficult way of expressing it, but if it is realized that each of the seven rays emits its own sound, and in so doing sets in motion those forces which must work in unison with it, the entire question of man's free will, of his eternal destiny and of his power to be self-assertive comes up for solution. These questions we shall seek to answer as we proceed. Some of the points which I may seek to make clear will not be capable of substantiation and cannot be proved by you. These it would be wise to accept as working hypotheses, in order to understand that whereof I seek to speak. Some of the points I may make you may find yourself capable of checking up in your own life experience, and they will call forth from you a recognition coming from your concrete mind, or they may produce in you a reaction of the intensest conviction, emanating from your intuitively aware self. In any case, read slowly. Apply the laws of analogy and of correspondence. Study yourself and your brethren. Seek to link what I say to any knowledge you may possess of the modern theories, and remember that the more truly you live as a soul the more surely you will comprehend that which may be imparted. As you study you must not forget the basic concept that in all occult work one is occupied with energy, energy units, energy embodied in forms, energy streams in flow and that these energies are made potent and embody our purpose through the use of thought. They follow along the well-defined thought currents of the group. It must be remembered, however, that it is in this region of thought that the cleavage comes between black and white magic. It is in the use of thought power that the two aspects of magic can be seen functioning, and therefore it is true that there is no black magic, per se, until one reaches the realm of mind. 
No one can be a black magician until the will and the thought work in unison, until mind control and the creative work of the focused mind can be seen. It has oft been said the black magician is rare, indeed, and that is verily true, because the creative thinker, with power to use the sustained will, is also rare. Let me illustrate. There is need for clear thinking on these matters, for as we study the psychology of the microcosm and arrive at an understanding of his ray impulses and energies we shall need to see clearly the way we go so that we shall tread the path of selflessness, leading to group awareness, and not the path of individualism, leading eventually and inevitably, as the mind aspect becomes organized, to the left-hand path of black magic. Those strong souls who consciously and knowingly enter into the realms of spiritual force and take thence that which they need and that which they choose, must work with intelligence, so that there may be a subsequent wise distribution of force within a chosen area. Those who know themselves to be in the rank and file of aspirants, but who possess the persistence which will drive them forward to the goal, need to remember that theirs is the responsibility of adding their quota to the sum total, and that this is done every time they think of the group correspond with a fellow aspirant or meditate. Extend the idea, then, from the student in a group to the group itself, regarding it as a group unit within a larger group. You have there a perfect analogy to the way the great ones work at this time. Regard, therefore, all your work as group work, causing effects which are inevitable and contributing to the potency of the group thought form. The second thing upon which I seek to touch concerns the testing going on inevitably among the aspirants and disciples at this time. This is not so much a testing of their place upon the path, as of their power to live in the world as citizens of another kingdom, and as the custodians of that which the world as a rule does not recognize. In so far as that testing is applied, and in so far as it can be gauged, I seek to point out that the testing is not applied, as some think because of their affiliation with any group or because of their one-pointed determination to tread the path. It is applied because the aspirants' own souls so ordained it, prior to incarnation, and it was the will of their souls that a certain measure of growth, hitherto unknown, should be attained, a certain degree of detachment from form should be achieved, and a certain preparation should be undergone which would lead to a liberation from the form life. The idea that a renewed effort towards the goal of spiritual light is the cause of trouble or precipitates disaster is not a statement of fact. The extent of the discipline to be undergone by a disciple is settled and known by his soul before he even takes a body, it is determined by law. It is this problem of energy units and their mutual interplay which underlies the entire subject of the rays which we shall seek to investigate. Every group in the world is a nucleus for the focusing and interplay of the seven types of force, just as every human being is also a meeting place for the seven types of energy, two in the ascendant and five less potent. Every group can consequently be a creative center and produce that which is an expression of the controlling energies and of the directed thought of the thinkers in the group. From the standpoint of those who see and guide, therefore, every group is constructing something that is relatively tangible and governed by certain building laws. The great work of the builders proceeds steadily. Often that which is built is inchoate, futile and without form or purpose, and of no use to either gods or men. But the race as a whole is now coming into an era wherein the mind is becoming a potent factor. Many are learning to hold the mind steady in the light, and consequently are receptive to ideas hitherto unrecognized. If a group of minds can be so drawn together and fused into an adequate synthesis, and if they, in their individual and daily meditation, keep focused or oriented towards that which can be apprehended, great concepts can be grasped and great ideas intuited. Men can train themselves, as a group, to think these intuited ideas of the true and the beautiful and of the plan into manifested existence, and thus a creation of beauty, embodying a divine principle, can be built. Ponder on this, seek to fit yourselves for the registering of these ideas and train yourselves to formulate them into thoughts and to transmit them so that others can apprehend them also. This is the nature of the real work to be done by the new groups, and students today who can grasp this idea have the opportunity to do some of this pioneering work. Always the individual of advancement and of poise has been able to do this intuiting, and to concretize the idea. Groups of students meditating synchronously should now attempt to do the same. 
The effort to synchronize effort does not relate so much to the time element as to unity of intent and of purpose. There is to be found today in the realm of the intuition much of wonder. This can be contacted. It is now the privilege of the race to contact that rain cloud of knowable things, to which the ancient seer Patanjali refers in his fourth book. The race, through its many aspirants, can today precipitate this rain cloud, so that the brains of men everywhere can register the contact. Hitherto this has been the privilege of the illumined and rare seer. In this way the new age will be ushered in and the new knowledge will enter into the minds of humanity. This can be practically demonstrated if those who are interested in this treatise on the seven rays can attune themselves to think clearly, and with a poised and illumined mind seek to understand what is relatively a new aspect of truth. In undertaking to reveal something anent the nature of the seven rays, I feel it necessary to remind all of you who take up this study that any speculation as to the emanating source of the rays must remain profitless until there is developed within each student that apparatus of response and that sensitive mechanism which will enable him to register a wider field of contacts than is at present possible. Many are as yet in the initial stage of registering an awareness of a field of expression which they know exists, the field of soul awareness, but which is not yet for them their normal field of expression. Many know a great deal about it, theoretically, but the practical effects of applied knowledge are not yet theirs. Many are conscious of consciousness, and are aware of the kingdom of the soul and of an occasional reaction to impression from that kingdom, but they are not yet consciousness itself, nor so identified with the soul that consciousness of all else drops away. To achieve that is their aim and objective. Let me also remind you that the career of the monad, an aspect of energy found on one or other of the three major rays, can be roughly divided into three parts, leading to a fourth. 1. A lower realization of a unity which is the unit of the form nature. In this unity, the soul is so closely identified with the matter aspect that it sees no distinction, but is the form, and knows not itself as soul. This often reaches its height in some life of full personality expression wherein the soul is completely centered in personality reactions. The lower life is so strong and vital that a powerful and material expression eventuates. 2. A subsequent and painful differentiation of the consciousness into a realized duality. In this condition, the man is distinctly aware of what is termed his essential duality. He knows he is spirit matter, is form life, and is the soul in manifestation. During this stage, which covers many lives and carries the man along the path of probation and discipleship as far as the third initiation, the center of gravity, if I may so express it, shifts steadily out of the form side and centers itself more and more in that of the soul. There is a growing consciousness that there is a reality which embraces, and at the same time extinguishes, duality. Remember that the entire story of evolution is the story of consciousness, and of a growing expansion of the becoming aware principle so that from the microscopic interest of the self-conscious man for we shall retain the parable within the confines of the fourth kingdom in nature we have a slowly developing inclusiveness which finally leads him into the consciousness of the cosmic christ three the higher realization of unity follows upon this sense of duality and in this final stage the sense of being soul and body is lost the consciousness identifies itself with the indwelling life of the planet and of the solar system. When this happens, there is the registering of a state of being which lies beyond word, mind and form expression of any kind. The great Jewish seer sought to convey these three stages in the words, I am, that, I am. He thus expressed them tritely and succinctly and adequately, had we but the development to know it. The third, however understood, defies expression and hints at a fourth type of realization which is that of deity itself, about which it profits us not to speculate. 2. Life Quality Appearance In our study of the rays it must therefore be remembered that we are dealing with life expression, through the medium of matter form. The highest unity will be cognized only when this dual relation is perfected. The theory of the one life may be held, but I deal not basically with theory but with that which may be known provided there is growth and intelligent application of truth. I deal with possibility and with that which is capable of achievement. Many these days like to talk and think in terms of that one life, but it remains but speech and thought, 
whilst the true awareness of that essential unity remains a dream and an imagining. Whenever this reality is put into words duality is emphasized in the spiritual controversy, using the word in its basic meaning and not in its ordinary warlike connotation, is enhanced. Take for example the words, I believe in the one life, or, to me, there is but one reality, and note how they are in their phraseology an expression of duality. Life cannot be expressed in words nor can its realized perfection. The process of becoming, which leads to being, is a cosmic event, involving all forms, and no son of God lies separated from that mutable process as yet. As long as he is in form he cannot know what life is, though, when he has attained certain steps and can function on the higher planes of the system in full awareness, he can begin to glimpse that awful reality. Certain great initiates, down the ages, have fulfilled their function of revealers, and have held before the eyes of the pioneering disciples of life the ideal of oneness and of unity. It has nevertheless been a matter of shifting the focus of attention progressively out of one form into another, and thus, from a higher standpoint getting a fresh glimpse of a possible truth. Each age, and the present is no exception, has believed its grasp of reality and its sensitivity to the inner beauty to be greater and nearer the true than was ever previously possible. The highest realization of what is termed the one life is the awareness, of the initiate of high degree, of the embodied logos, of deity, and his identification with the consciousness of that stupendous creator who is seeking expression through the medium of the solar system. No initiate on the planet can identify himself with the consciousness of that identified being, in the esoteric sense of the term, who, speaking in the Bhagavad Gita, says, having pervaded the entire universe with a fragment of myself, I remain. These thoughts I commend to your consideration and to your careful pondering, begging you to see to it that there is a steady expansion of your sense of awareness and a growing capacity to make understanding contacts with that emerging truth, reality and beauty which the universe declares. Guard yourself at the same time from mystical rhapsodies anent the one life, which are apt to be no more than the negation of all mental apprehension and a luxuriating in the sensuous perception of a highly developed and high-grade emotional nature. All our considerations therefore in this treatise on the seven rays will necessarily be held within the realm of thought which involves awareness of duality. I shall employ the language of duality, and this I shall do, not because I seek to emphasize it to the neglect of unity, for this unity is to me somewhat of a reality and I glimpse more than a possibility, but because all aspirants and disciples and all initiates up to the third initiation, as I earlier said, are swinging as a pendulum between the pairs of opposites, spirit and matter. I speak not here of the pairs of opposites of the astral or emotional plane, which are illusory reflections of the true pairs of opposites, but of the basic duality of manifestation. I seek to deal with that material which is of practical value and which can be grasped by the illumined intelligence of the average man. It is necessary for all students who seek illumination and a right apprehension of truth to drop the emphasis so often laid upon certain aspects and presentations of truth being spiritual and others being mental. It is in the realm of so-called mind that the great principle of separateness is found. It is also in the realm of mind that the great at one meant is made. The words of the initiate Paul have here a fitting place, wherein he says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ, and adds in another place that Christ had made, in himself, of twain, one new man. It is through the mind that theory is formulated, truth distinguished and deity apprehended. When we are more advanced upon the path, we shall see naught but spirit everywhere, and the aphorism, enunciated by that great disciple, H.P.B., that, matter is spirit at the lowest point of its cyclic activity, and, spirit is matter on the seventh plane, or the highest, will be a realized fact in our consciousness. It is as yet but an intellectual phrase which means little except the enunciation of a truth, incapable of proof. Everything is an expression of a spiritual consciousness, which spiritualizes by its inherent life all matter forms. A grub or worm working out its little life in a mass of decaying substance is as much a spiritual manifestation as an initiate working out his destiny in a mass of rapidly changing human forms. It is all manifested deity, it is all divine expression and all a form of sensitive awareness and of response to environment, and therefore a form of conscious expression.
The seven rays are the first differentiation of the divine triplicity of spirit consciousness form, and they provide the entire field of expression for the manifested deity. We are told in the scriptures of the world that the interplay, or the relation between, Father, Spirit and Mother, matter produces eventually a third, which is the Son, or the consciousness aspect. That Son, the product of the two, is esoterically defined as, the one who was third but is the second. The reason for this wording is that there first existed the two divine aspects, spirit matter, or matter impregnated with life, and it was only when these two realized their mutual unity, note the necessary ambiguity of that phrase, that the sun emerged. The esotericist, however, regards spirit matter as the first unity, and the sun therefore as the second factor. This sun, who is divine life incarnate in matter, and consequently the producer of the diversity and immensity of forms, is the embodiment of divine quality. We might therefore utilize, for the sake of clarity, the terms life quality appearance as interchangeable with the more usual trinity of spirit soul body, or life consciousness form. I shall utilize the word life when referring to spirit, to energy, to the father, to the first aspect of divinity, and to that essential dynamic electric fire which produces all that is and as the sustaining, originating cause and source of all manifestation. I shall use the word appearance to express that which we call matter, or form, or objective expression. It is that illusory tangible outer appearance which is animated by life. This is the third aspect, the mother, overshadowed and fertilized by the Holy Ghost, or life, united with intelligent substance. This is fire by friction a friction brought about by life and matter and their interplay, and producing change and constant mutation. I shall use the word quality as expressive of the second aspect, the Son of God, the cosmic Christ incarnate in form, a form brought into being by the relation of spirit and matter. This interplay produces that psychological entity which we call the Christ. This cosmic Christ demonstrated to us his perfection, as far as the human family is concerned, through the medium of the historical Christ. This psychological entity can bring into functioning activity a quality within all human forms which esoterically can obliterate the forms, and so engross the attention as to be regarded eventually as the main factor and as constituting all that is. This truth as to life and quality and form is made most clearly apparent to us in the story of the Christ of Galilee. He was constantly reminding the people that he was not what he appeared to be, Neither was he the Father in heaven, and he is ever referred to by those who know and love him in terms of quality. He demonstrated to us the quality of the love of God, and in himself he embodied not only that which he had evolved of the seven ray qualities, but also, as do few of the sons of God, a basic principle of the ray of the solar logos himself, the quality of love. This we shall study more closely when we take up the consideration of the second ray of love wisdom. The seven rays are therefore embodiments of seven types of force which demonstrate to us the seven qualities of deity. These seven qualities have consequently a sevenfold effect upon the matter and forms to be found in all parts of the universe, and have also a sevenfold interrelation between themselves. Life quality appearance are brought together into a synthesis in the manifested universe and in man incarnate, and the result of this synthesis is sevenfold producing seven types of qualified forms which emerge on all planes and in all kingdoms. It must be remembered that all the planes which we, from our little point of view, regard as formless are not really so. Our seven planes are but the seven subplanes of the cosmic physical plane. We shall not deal with the planes, except in their relation to man's unfoldment, nor shall we deal with the macrocosm, or with the developing life of the cosmic Christ. We shall confine our attention entirely to man and to his psychological reactions to the qualified forms in three directions, to those in the subhuman kingdoms in nature, to those with whom he associates in the human family and to the guiding hierarchy and the world of souls. The seven ray types must be dealt with entirely from the human angle, for this treatise is intended to give the new psychological approach to man through an understanding of the energies, seven in number, with their forty-nine differentiations, which animate him and make him what he is. Later, as we take up each ray type, we shall subject man to a close analysis and study his reactions in these three directions.
These seven rays are the seven streams of force issuing from a central energy after, in point of time, that vortex of energy had been set up. Spirit and matter became mutually interactive and the form or appearance of the solar system began its process of becoming, a process leading to an eventual being. This idea is ancient and true. We find reference to the seven eons and the seven emanations and to the life and nature of the seven spirits which are before the throne of God. In the writings of Plato and of all initiates who laid down in ancient times the basic propositions which have guided the human mentality down the ages. These great lives, functioning within the boundaries of the solar system, gathered to themselves that substance which they required for manifestation and built it into those forms and appearances through which they could best express their innate qualities. Within the radius of their influence, they gathered all that now appears. This aggregated, qualified material constitutes their body of manifestation, just as the solar system is the body of manifestation of the trinity of aspects. This idea can best be apprehended if one remembers that every human being is, in his turn, an aggregate of atoms and cells built into form and having scattered throughout that form organs and centers of differentiated life which function in rhythm and relation, but which have varying influences and differing purposes. These aggregated and animated forms present an appearance of an entity or central life which is characterized by its own quality, and which functions according to the point in evolution thus making an impress by its radiation and life upon every atom and cell and organism within the radius of immediate influence and also upon every other human being contacted. Man is a psychic entity, a life who, through radiatory influence, has built a form, colored it with his own psychic quality and thus presented an appearance to the environing world which will persist for as long a time as he lives in form. This statement covers also the life story and the qualified appearance of any one of the seven rays. God, ray, life, and man are all psychological entities and builders of forms. Therefore a great psychological life is appearing through the medium of a solar system. Seven psychological lives, qualified by seven types of force, are appearing through the medium of the seven planets. Each planetary life repeats the same technique of manifestation, life quality appearance, and in its second aspect of quality demonstrates as a psychological entity. Every human being is a miniature replica of the entire plan. He is also spirit soul body, life quality appearance. He colors his appearance with his quality and animates it with his life. Because all appearances are expressions of quality and the lesser is included in the greater, Every form in nature and every human being is found upon one or other of the seven qualifying rays and his appearance in a phenomenal form is colored by the quality of his basic ray. It is qualified predominantly by the ray of the particular life upon whose emanation he issued forth, but it will include also in a secondary measure the six other ray types. Let us therefore posit, as a symbolical analogy, the fact of a central life extraneous and outside our solar system yet within it during the process of manifestation, which decides within itself to take a material form and to incarnate. A vortex of force is set up as a preliminary step and we then have God immanent and God transcendent at the same time. This vortex, as a result of this initial activity, demonstrates through the medium of what we call substance or, to use a technical term of modern science, which is the best we can do at this time, through the ether of space. The consequence of this active interplay of life and substance is that a basic unity is constituted. Father and mother are at one. This unity is characterized by quality. Through this triplicity of life quality form, the central life evokes and manifests consciousness, or awareness of response to all that is eventuating, but in a degree which it is impossible for us to cognize, limited as we are by our present relatively undeveloped point in evolution. Students of this treatise must bear in mind, from the very start of their studies, the necessity for familiarizing themselves with these four conditioning factors, life quality appearance, and their result or synthesis which we call consciousness. Always, therefore, we predicate that which stands outside of the appearance and which is conscious of that appearance. This involves awareness of its material development and consequent adequacy of expression 
and also awareness of its psychic unfoldment. No study of the rays is possible apart from this fourfold recognition. Our grasp of the subject will be much facilitated if we train ourselves to regard ourselves as an accurate, though as yet undeveloped, expression and reflection of this initial creative quaternary. We are lives, making an appearance, expressing quality and slowly becoming aware of the process and the objective, as our consciousness becomes more like that of divinity itself. 3. The Seven Rays Enumerated As part of the initial plan, the One Life sought expansion, and the seven eons or emanations came forth from the central vortex and actively repeated the earlier process in all its details. They too came into manifestation and in the work of expressing active life, qualified by love and limited by an outward phenomenal appearance, they swept into a secondary activity and became the seven builders, the seven sources of life and the seven rishis of all the ancient scriptures. They are the original psychic entities, imbued with the capacity to express love, which involves the concept of duality, for the loving and the loved, the desiring and the desired, must here be posited, and to emerge from subjective being into objective becoming. We call these seven by various names, as follows. 1. The Lord of Power or Will. This life wills to love, and uses power as an expression of divine beneficence. For his body of manifestation he uses that planet for which the sun is regarded as the esoteric substitute. 2. The Lord of Love Wisdom, who is the embodiment of pure love, is regarded by esotericists as being as close to the heart of the solar logos as was the beloved disciple close to the heart of the Christ of Galilee. This life instills into all forms the quality of love, with its more material manifestation of desire, and as the attractive principle in nature and the custodian of the law of attraction, which is the life demonstration of pure being. This Lord of Love is the most potent of the seven rays, because he is on the same cosmic ray as the solar deity. He expresses himself primarily through the planet Jupiter, which is his body of manifestation. 3. The Lord of Active Intelligence. His work is more closely linked to matter and he works in cooperation with the Lord of the Second Ray. He is the motivating impulse in the initial work of creation. The planet Saturn is his body of expression within the solar system, and through the medium of matter, which beneficently obstructs and hinders, he provides humanity with a vast field of experiment and experience. I should like to point out here that when I speak in terms of personality and perforce employ the personal pronoun, I must not be accused of personalizing these great forces. I speak in terms of entity, of pure being, and not in terms of human personality. But the handicap of language persists, and in teaching those who think in terms of the lower concrete mind, and whose intuition is dormant or only manifesting in flashes, I am compelled to speak in parables and use the language of word symbols. Let me point out also that all statements which I may make are in relation to our particular planet and couched in terms that can be understood by the humanity which our planet has produced. The work, as I outline it, constitutes only a fraction of the work undertaken by these beings. They each have their own purpose and radius of influence, and as our Earth is not one of the seven sacred planets, nor the body of manifestation of one of the basic seven rays, they have purposes and activities in which our Earth plays only a minor part. 4. The Lord of Harmony, Beauty and Art. The main function of this being is the creation of beauty, as an expression of truth through the free interplay of life and form, basing the design of beauty upon the initial plan as it exists in the mind of the solar logos. The body of manifestation of this life is not revealed, but the activity emanating from it produces that combination of sounds, colors and word music that expresses, through the form of the ideal, that which is the originating idea. This fourth lord of creative expression will resume activity upon the earth about 600 years hence. Though already the first faint impress of his influence is being felt and the next century will see a reawakening of creative art in all its branches. 5. The Lord of Concrete Knowledge and Science. This is a great life in close touch with the mind of the creative deity, just as the Lord of the Second Ray is in close touch with the heart of that same deity. His influence is great at this time, though not as potent as it will be later. Science is a psychological unfoldment in man due to this ray influence, and is only entering into its real work. His influence is waxing in power, 
just as the influence of the Sixth Lord is waning. 6. The Lord of Devotion and Idealism. This solar deity is a peculiar and characteristic expression of the quality of the solar logos. Forget not that in the great scheme of the universal universe, not just our universe, our solar logos is as differentiated and distinctive in quality as are any of the sons of men. This ray force, with the second ray, is a true and vital expression of the divine nature. A militant focusing upon the ideal, a one-pointed devotion to the intent of the life urge, and a divine sincerity are the qualities of this Lord, and set their impress upon all that is found within his body of manifestation. Advanced esotericists debate as to whether Mars is, or is not, the planet through which he manifests. You must remember that only a few of the planets are the bodies of expression of the Lords of the Rays. There are ten planets of expression, to use the term employed by the ancient Rishis, and only seven ray lives are regarded as the builders of the system. The great mystery, which is finally revealed in the higher initiations, is the relation of a ray to a planet. Therefore seek not full information at this time. The influence of this sixth lord is now passing out. 7. The Lord of Ceremonial Order or Magic is now coming into power and is slowly but surely making his pressure felt. His influence is most potent upon the physical plane, for there is a close numerical interrelation between, for instance, the Lord of the Seventh Ray and the Seventh Plane, the physical, just as the Seventh Root Race will see complete conformity to and a perfect expression of law and order. This ray of order and its incoming is partially responsible for the present tendency in world affairs toward governmental dictatorship and the imposed control of a central governing body. It may be of value here if I give you the following statement as to the activity, or non-activity, of the rays, begging you to bear in mind that this statement refers only to our Earth and its evolutions. Ray 1. Not in manifestation. Ray 2. In manifestation since 1575 AD Ray 3. In manifestation since 1425 AD. Ray 4. To come slowly into manifestation after 2025 AD Ray 5. In manifestation since 1775 AD. Ray 6. Passing rapidly out of manifestation. It began to pass out in 1625 AD Ray 7. In manifestation since 1675 AD. These are of course all lesser cycles within the influence of the sign Pisces. You will see that four rays are in manifestation at this time, the second, third, fifth, and seventh. The question arises here. How does it happen that we find people in incarnation on all the rays at practically the same time? The reason is that, as you can easily see, the fourth is beginning to approach and the sixth is passing out which puts six of the rays in the position of having their egos in manifestation. There are however very few of the fourth ray egos on the earth at this time, and a very large number of sixth ray egos, for it will be about 200 years before all the sixth ray egos pass out of incarnation. As to the first ray egos, there are no pure first ray types on the planet. Also called first ray egos are on the first subray of the second ray, which is in incarnation. A pure first ray ego in incarnation at this time would be a disaster. There is not sufficient intelligence and love in the world to balance the dynamic will of an ego on the ray of the destroyer. Just as the human family has a relation to the planetary logos of our Earth which is best expressed by stating that it constitutes his heart and brain, so does the sum total of analogous evolutions within the entire solar system constitute the heart and brain of the solar logos. Intelligent activity and love are the outstanding characteristics of a developed son of God, whilst their lower reflections, sex and desire, are the characteristics of the average man and the undeveloped sons of God. These seven living qualified emanations from the central vortex of force are composed of untold myriads of energy units which are inherently and innately aspects of life, endowed with quality and capable of appearance. Below the human, the combination of these three produces conscious response to the environment, regarding the environment as composed of the sum total of all lives, qualities and appearances, the synthesis of the seven rays or emanations of the deity. They produce in the human kingdom a self-conscious awareness, and in the superhuman world a synthetic inclusiveness. 
All human monads, carried into manifestation by the will and desire of some ray lord, are part of his body of manifestation. Potentially they express his quality and appear phenomenally according to the point in evolutionary expression which has been reached. As he is, so are we in this world, but only as yet potentially, the goal of evolution being to make the potential into the real, and the latent into the expressed. The work of the esotericist is just this very thing. To bring out of latency, the hidden quality. 4. The function of Christianity I have now laid down the basic premise that all that is known to us is a manifesting divine entity, expressing itself through three aspects which, for the purposes of this treatise and because they are more in line with the terminology of emerging modern thought, I choose to call life quality appearance. These are but other names for the trinity of all the great religions, and are synonymous with the Christian phrase, Father, Son and Holy Ghost, those old anthropomorphic terms, with spirit, soul and body, the current phraseology, and with the life, consciousness and form of the Indian philosophy. May I interpolate here the comment that modern thinkers would do well to bear in mind that the importance of Christianity lies in the realization that it is a bridging religion. This is symbolized for us by the fact that the master of all the masters took incarnation in Palestine, that slice of land which is midway between Asia and Europe, and which partakes of the character of both. Christianity is the religion of the transitional period which links the era of self-conscious existence with that of a group-conscious world. It is extant in the age which will see that type of thought prevailing which, when rightly applied, will serve as the connecting link between the worlds of concrete and of abstract mind. The old commentary puts it thus. When the hour arrives wherein the light of the soul reveals the antaskarana, the bridge between the personality consciousness and the soul consciousness, A.A.B. Then shall men be known by their knowledge, be colored by the despair of desire unappeased, be divided into those who recognize their dharma, meet all implied obligations and duties, and those who only see the working out of karma, and from the very nature of their need find light and peace at last. Christianity is primarily a religion of cleavage, demonstrating to man his duality and so laying the foundation for future unity. This is a most needed stage and has served humanity well. The purpose and intent of Christianity has been definite and high, and it has done its divine work. Today it is in the process of being superseded, but by what new formulation of truth is not yet revealed. The light is slowly pouring into man's life, and in this lighted radiance he will formulate the new religion and arrive at a fresh enunciation of ancient truth. Through the lens of the illumined mind, he will shortly see aspects of divinity hitherto unknown. Has it ever dawned on you that there may be qualities and characteristics of the divine nature, latent as yet within the form, that have hitherto remained totally unknown and not even dimly sensed? and which, as yet, are literally unprecedented and for which we have neither words nor other adequate medium of expression. So it is. Just as the phrase, group consciousness, would carry, for early primitive man, no significance whatsoever, and would have been only a meaningless string of alphabetical forms, so, lingering just below the surface of our manifested world, lie divine qualities and a purpose which is as far removed from the consciousness of our present humanity as the idea of collective awareness was from the consciousness of prehistoric humanity. Take courage from this thought. The past guarantees the infinite expansion of the future. Certain questions and their answers. 1. What is the soul and its nature? 2. What is the origin, goal, purpose and plan of the soul? 3. Can the fact of the soul be proved? 4. Of what value is it to study the rays? 5. What is the meaning of, sentiency, consciousness awareness, energy or light? Chapter 2. Certain Questions and Their Answers. I indicated that in this treatise we would give our main attention to the central one of the three aspects, and would concentrate upon quality. What do I mean by this? I mean that we shall occupy ourselves with that which is emerging through the medium of form, with that which veils or hides itself behind the appearance, which is expressive of life or spirit, and which is produced through the interplay of life with matter. This, when posited of man, the reflection of divinity, 
and when applied to the subject of his quality, involves three recognitions. 1. That a human being is, as earlier said, an embodied life, expressing quality and registering that quality in consciousness or as sensitive response to the interplay going forward, during the evolutionary process, between spirit and matter. 2. That man, being a synthesis, and the only complete synthesis, except the macrocosmic deity, registers a self-recognition which is potent enough today to enable him to differentiate reactions to a. The triplicity, as the Bhagavad Gita calls it, of the knower, the field of knowledge, and knowledge. b. A growing realization that the field of knowledge is but an appearance or an illusion, that knowledge itself can be a hindrance unless transmuted into wisdom. c. An evolutionary growth in responsiveness to one or other of these three, and which indicates a developing sensitivity. This is leading to a growth of interest in the knower and to a belief that this knower is the soul, one with deity, illimitable and eternal and, in time and space, the determining factor in human existence. 3. That the endless diversity of forms hides a subjective synthesis. Man can therefore eventually see, expressing itself through all forms in all kingdoms, a universal septenate, and when this happens, he is then entering into the world of subjective unity, and can proceed on his way consciously towards the One. He cannot as yet enter into the consciousness of that basic essential unity, but he can enter into that of his own ray life, of the emanating source of his own temporarily specialized life. This triplicity of ideas requires careful study. It might be expressed thus. Oh, the One Life. Unity. Oh oh oh, the major three rays. Oh 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 oh, the minor four rays, making seven oh, the unity of appearance. With the one life we shall not concern ourselves. We accept it as a basic truth and we realize that we are on our way back from the unity of form identified existence, through the varying unfoldments of a conscious response to divine interplay and activity, to a final identification with the one life. Form awareness has to give place to the qualified radiation of the self-conscious spiritual identity which is that of a son of God, appearing through form. This will be finally superseded by two phases of expression wherein there is 1. A sense of divine synthesis, of which our bodily well-being is the lowest form of material, yet symbolic, reflection. It is a sense of coordinated blissful satisfaction, based on realized being. 2. A withdrawal from even this life awareness to a phase still more intensive and detached, which involves an awareness of the life of God itself, free from form, but still, in a mysterious sense, aware of quality. In the language of mysticism it might be expressed this way. I take a body. That body is alive. I know its life. I therefore know my mother. I use a body. That body is not me. I serve the group and in this serving live within the body, detached, a son of God. I know myself. I infuse a body. I am its life and in that life shall I see life. That life is known as love. I am the love of God. I know the Father, and know his life as love. I am the body and its loving life. I am the self, whose quality is love. I am the life of God himself. The mother father son am I. Behind these three there stands the unknown God. That God am I. Let us be perfectly clear even at the expense of reiteration. In this treatise, though we may touch upon form and consider its nature, we shall lay emphasis upon self-consciousness as it expresses itself as responsiveness, as awareness of a peculiar kind which we call the quality of consciousness, or its inherent characteristic. We have always the subsidiary triplicities, which are only adjectival terms employed to express the quality of the appearing life. Form. Mutability. Conscious response to radiation. Matter. Self-consciousness. Responsiveness. Awareness of identity. Soul. Life. Immutability. Emanation. Cause. Source. Spirit. The synthesis of all these in manifestation we call God, the isolated, the all-pervading, the detached and the withdrawn. The above abstract truths are difficult of apprehension, but need here to be expressed, 
so that our platform is understood and we are not open to the criticism that we neglect reality and regard diversity as the only truth. We shall now answer five questions that I have formulated and answered for the reader. Question 1. What is the soul? Can we define it? What is its nature? Here I shall give but four definitions which will serve as a basis for all that follows. A the soul can be spoken of as the son of the father and of the mother, spirit matter, and is therefore the embodied life of God, coming into incarnation in order to reveal the quality of the nature of God, which is essential love. This life, taking form, nurtures the quality of love within all forms, and ultimately reveals the purpose of all creation. This is the simplest definition for average humanity, being couched in the language of mysticism, thus linking the truth as found in all religions. It is necessarily inadequate, for it fails to emphasize the truth that what can be posited of man can also be posited of the cosmic reality, and that just as a human appearance on earth veils both the quality and purpose, in varying degree, so does that synthesis of all forms or appearances, within that unity which we call a solar system, veil the quality and purpose of deity. It is only when man is no longer deluded by appearance and has freed himself from the veil of illusion that he arrives at a knowledge of the quality of God's consciousness and at the purpose which it is revealing. This he does in a triple way. a. He discovers his own soul, the product of the union of his father in heaven with the mother or the material nature. This last is the personality. He then, having discovered the personality, discovers the quality of his own soul life, and the purpose for which he has appeared. b. He finds that this quality expresses itself through seven aspects or basic differentiations, and that this septenate of qualities colors, esoterically, all forms in all kingdoms in nature, thus constituting the totality of the revelations of the divine purpose. This, he finds, is essentially a septenary aggregation of energies, each energy producing differing effects and appearances. This discovery he makes by finding that his own soul is tinctured by one of the seven ray qualities, that he is identified with his ray purpose, whatever it may be, and is expressing a particular type of divine energy. c. From this point he proceeds to a recognition of the entire septenate, and upon the path of initiation he gains a glimpse of a unity, hitherto unrealized, nor even sensed. Thus from a consciousness of himself, man arrives at an awareness of the interrelation between the seven basic energies or rays, and from that he proceeds to a realization of the triple deity, until at the final initiation, the fifth, he finds himself consciously at one with the unified divine intent lying behind all appearances and all qualities. It might be added that initiations, higher than the fifth, reveal a purpose wider and deeper than that which is working out within our solar system. The purpose of our manifested logos is but a part of a greater intent. It might also be noted that in the fourth kingdom of nature, on the path of evolution and of probation, a man arrives at a knowledge of his individual soul, and glimpses the quality and purpose of that soul. On the path of discipleship and of initiation, he glimpses the quality and purpose of his planetary life, and discovers himself as a part of a ray life which is appearing through the form of a planet and is embodying an aspect of the divine purpose and energy. After the third initiation he glimpses the quality and purpose of the solar system. He sees his ray life and energy as a part of a greater whole. These are but modes of expressing the emerging quality and the hidden purpose of the graded lives which inform all appearances and color them with quality. B. The soul can be regarded as the principle of intelligence an intelligence whose characteristics are mind and mental awareness, which in turn demonstrate as the power to analyze, to discriminate, to separate, and to distinguish, to choose or to reject, with all the implications conveyed in these terms. As long as a man is identified with the appearance, these aspects of the mental principle produce in him the great heresy of separateness. It is the appearance of the form nature that glamours him and completely deludes him. He regards himself as the form, and then proceeds from a realization of himself as the material form, and as identified with the outer appearance, to a realization of himself as an insatiable desire. He then becomes identified with his desire body, with his appetites, good and bad, and considers himself as one with his moods, his feelings, his longings, 
whether they ray out in the direction of the material world or inward toward the world of thought or the kingdom of the soul. He is torn by a sense of duality. Later, he becomes identified with still another of the appearances, with the mind body or nature. Thoughts become to him so tangible that he is swayed, turned and influenced by them. And to the world of material appearances, and to the world of the great illusion is added the world of thought forms. He is then subjected to a triple illusion, and he, the conscious life behind the illusion, begins to unify the forms into one coordinated whole, in order the better to control them. Thus the personality of the soul makes its appearance. He stands then on the verge of the probationary path. He enters the world of quality and of value, and begins to discover the nature of the soul and to shift the emphasis from the appearance to the quality of the life which has produced it. This identification of the quality with the appearance grows steadily upon the path until the fusion of quality and appearance, of energy and that which it energizes, is so perfect that appearance no longer veils the reality, and the soul is now the dominant factor. Consciousness is now identified with itself, or with its ray, and not with its phenomenal appearance. Later, the soul itself is superseded by the monad, and that monad becomes, in verity, embodied purpose. The process can be expressed by a very simple symbology, as follows. O. 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 Or O. O. O or O. 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 Thus portraying the separateness of the three aspects. The union, then, of the aspects of appearance, quality, purpose or life, results in an abstraction from the appearance, and therefore the end of phenomenal existence. Ponder on the simple arrangement of these signs, for they portray your life and progress. On of this is true of the human being, of the Christ in incarnation. It is equally true of the cosmic Christ, of God incarnate in the solar system. In the system a similar fusion and blending is going on, and the separated aspects are entering into an evolutionary relationship, resulting in an eventual synthesis of appearance and quality, and then of quality and purpose. It might be noted here that the hierarchy as a whole is distinguished by the sign O. U. The new group of world servers by the sign U. O. And the unevolved masses by OOO. Forget not, that in all three groups, as in nature, there are the intermediate stages composed of those who are on their way to a transitional accomplishment. The work before all students of this treatise on the seven rays is the fusion of quality and appearance, and therefore they need to study the nature of that quality in order to produce a true appearance. In the ancient rules given to mystics in Atlantean times we find these words. Let the disciple know the nature of his Lord of Love. 7. The aspects of the love of God. 7. The colors of that manifesting one. 7. Fold the work. 7. The energies and 7. Fold the path back to the center of peace. Let the disciple live in love, and love in life. In those olden days no thought of purpose entered into the minds of men, for the race was not mental nor was it intended so to be. The emphasis was laid upon the quality of the appearance in all preparation for initiation and the highest initiate of that time endeavored to express only the quality of God's love. The plan was the great mystery. The Christ, cosmic and individual, was sensed and known, but purpose was as yet veiled and unrevealed. The noble eightfold path was not known, and only seven steps into the temple were seen. With the coming in of the Aryan race, the purpose and the plan began to be revealed. Only when the appearance is beginning to be dominated by quality, and consciousness is expressing itself in directed awareness through the form, is the purpose dimly sensed. I seek in various ways to convey through the symbol of words the significance of the soul. The soul is therefore the Son of God, the product of the marriage of spirit and matter. The soul is an expression of the mind of God, for mind and intellect are terms expressing the cosmic principle of intelligent love, a love which produces an appearance through the nature of mind and thus is the builder of the separate forms or appearances. The soul also, through the quality of love, produces the fusion of appearance and of quality, of awareness and of form. See the soul as, and hear words limit and distort, a unit of light, colored by a particular ray vibration. It is a vibrating center of energy found within the appearance or form of its entire ray life. 
It is one of seven groups of millions of lives which in their totality constitute the one life. From its very nature, the soul is conscious or aware in three directions. It is God conscious, it is group conscious, it is self conscious. This self conscious aspect is brought to fruition in the phenomenal appearance of a human being. The group conscious aspect retains the human state of consciousness, but adds to it awareness of its ray life, progressively unfolded. Its awareness then is the awareness of love, of quality, of spirit in its relationships. It is God conscious only potentially, and in that unfoldment lies, for the soul, its own growth upward and outward after its self conscious aspect is perfected and its group awareness is recognized. The soul therefore has the following points, or appearances. Aspirants who are studying and training themselves to live the life of service might be regarded as having reached the point where the line is to be found. To visualize this correctly, the sign should be regarded as in rapid revolution thus producing a turning wheel, which is the wheel of life. Let me again repeat. 1. The soul is the Son of God, the product of the union of spirit and matter. 2. The soul is an embodiment of conscious mind, the expression, if one might so phrase it, of divine intelligent awareness. 3. The soul is a unit of energy, vibrating in unison with one of the seven ray lives, and colored by a particular ray light. The personality of the soul is intended to be an embodiment of love, applied with intelligence and producing those attractive forms which will serve to express that loving intelligence. The soul in its turn is intended to be the embodiment of divine purpose or will, intelligently applied in the great creative work, which is produced through the power of creative love. Each son of God can say, I am born of the love of the father for the mother, of the desire of life for form. I express, therefore, the love and the magnetic attractiveness of the God nature, and the responsiveness of the form nature, and am consciousness itself, aware of deity or life. Each intelligent point of life can say, I am the product of intelligent will, working through intelligent activity and producing a world of created forms which embody or veil the loving purpose of deity. Each vibrating unit of energy can say, I am part of a divine whole which in its septenary nature expresses the love and life of the one reality, colored by one of the seven qualities of the love of deity and responsive to the other qualities. For our purposes in this treatise, we must grasp the fact that the world of appearances is energized by and vibrating to the world of qualities or values, which world, in its turn, is energized by or vibrating to the world of purpose or of will. Therefore, as is stated in The Secret Doctrine and in a treatise on cosmic fire, the electric fire of will, and the solar fire of love, in cooperation with fire by friction, produce the world of created and creative forms. These proceed under the law of attractive magnetic love towards the evolutionary accomplishment of a purpose. At present inscrutable, this purpose remains unknown only on account of the limitations of the appearance, which is not yet responsive to the quality. When the illusory appearance and the veiled quality of the life are known and comprehended the underlying purpose will emerge with clarity. Indications of this can be dimly sensed and the attribute of this growing awareness can be noted in the tendency of modern thought to speak of patterns and of plans, of blueprints and synthetic formulations of ideas, and in the tracing of historical developments, national, racial, human and psychological. As we read, ponder and study, the dim outlines of the plan appear but until the consciousness has transcended all human limitations and has included the subhuman, as well as the superhuman, within its range of contacts, the true plan cannot be rightly grasped. The will, lying behind the purpose, cannot be understood until the consciousness has transcended even that of the superhuman man, and has become one with the divine. Will or the energy of life are synonymous terms and are an abstraction, existing apart from all form expression. The will to be emerges from outside the solar system altogether. It is the all-pervading energy of God which informs with a fraction of itself the solar system, and yet remains outside. Plan and purpose concern the emanating energies of that central life and involve duality, will or the life urge plus attractive magnetic love which, in its turn, is the response of the vibrating universal substance to the impact of the energy of will. This initial activity precedes the creative process of form building and the play of the divine will on the ocean of space, 
matter, or etheric substance produced the first differentiation into the major rays, and their mutual interplay produced the minor four rays. Thus the seven emanations, the seven potencies and the seven rays came into manifestation. They are the seven breaths of the one life, the seven basic energies, they streamed forth from the center formed by the impact of the will of God on divine substance, and divided into seven streams of force. The radius of the influence of these seven streams determined the extent or scope of activity of a solar system and, outlined, the limits of the form of the incarnated cosmic Christ. Each of these seven streams or emanations of energy was colored by a divine quality, an aspect of love, and all of them were needed for the ultimate perfecting of the latent and unrevealed purpose. The will of deity colored the stream of energy units which we call by the name of the ray of will or power, the first ray, and the impact of that stream on the matter of space ensured that the hidden purpose of deity would inevitably and eventually be revealed. It is a ray of such dynamic intensity that we call it the ray of the destroyer. It is not as yet functioning actively. It will come into full play only when the time comes for the purpose to be safely revealed. Its units of energy in manifestation in the human kingdom are very few. As I earlier said, there is not a true first ray type in incarnation as yet. Its main potency is to be found in the mineral kingdom, and the key to the mystery of the first ray is to be found in radium. In the vegetable kingdom the second ray is peculiarly active, producing among other things the magnetic attractiveness of flowers. The mystery of the second ray is found to be hidden in the significance of the perfume of flowers. Perfume and radium are related, being emanatory. Expressions of ray effects upon differing groupings of material substance. The third ray is, in its turn, peculiarly related to the animal kingdom, producing the tendency to intelligent activity which we note in the higher domestic animals. The correspondence to radioactivity and to emanatory perfumes which we found in the mineral and vegetable kingdoms, we here call devotion, the characteristic of the attractive interplay between the domestic animals and man. Devotees of personalities might more rapidly transmute that devotion into its higher correspondence, love of principles, if they realized that they were only displaying an animal emanation. The desire of the deity expresses itself through the second ray of love wisdom. Desire is a word which has been prostituted to cover the tendency of humanity to crave material things or those pleasures which bring satisfaction to the sensuous nature. It is applied to those conditions which will satisfy the personality, but in the last analysis, desire is essentially love. This desire expresses itself by attractiveness, by its capacity to draw to itself and into the radius of its influence that which is loved. It is the bond of coherence, and is that principle of magnetic cohesion which lies behind all creative work and which produces the emergence into the light of manifestation of those forms or appearances through which it is possible to satisfy desire. This second ray is pre-eminently the ray of applied consciousness, and works through the creation and development of those forms which are found throughout the universe. They are essentially mechanisms for the development of responsiveness or awareness, they are sensitive machines, responsive to an enveloping environment. This is true of all forms, from that of a crystal to that of a solar system. They have been created in the great process of satisfying desire and of providing the media of contact which will guarantee a progressive satisfaction. In the human family, the effect of this dual interplay of life, desiring satisfaction, and of form, providing the field of experience, is a consciousness which is striving towards a love of the formless instead of desire for form, and the wise adaptation of all experience to the process of transmuting desire into love. Hence this ray is, par excellence, the dual ray of the solar logos himself, and hence colors all manifested forms, directing all consciousness in all forms in all kingdoms of nature, and in all fields of development, it carries the life through the range of forms in that basic search or urge for the attainment of bliss through the satisfaction of desire. This urge and the interaction of the pairs of opposites produce the varying types of conscious reaction to experience which, in their main stages, we call consciousness, animal consciousness, and allied differentiating phrases. This second ray is the ray of deity itself, and is colored by distinctive aspects of desire or love. They produce the totality of the manifested appearances, animated by the life which determines the quality. 
The father, spirit or life, wills to seek the satisfaction of desire. The mother or matter meets the desire and is attracted also by the father. Their mutual response initiates the creative work, and the son is born, inheriting from the father the urge to desire or love, and from the mother the tendency actively to create forms. Thus, in the language of symbolism, have the form worlds come into being, and through the evolutionary work the process is going forward of satisfying the desire of spirit. Thus in the two major rays of will and love we have the two main characteristics of the divine nature, which lie latent behind all the myriad of forms. The eons will see these two energies steadily dominating all appearance and driving the created world onto a full display of the divine nature. This is true of gods and men. But in the same way in which the father contributes to the son the divine qualities of will and love, so the mother contributes much also, and the initial duality is increased and the qualities are enhanced by the addition of a quality inherent in matter itself, the quality or ray of intelligent activity. This is the third of the divine attributes and completes, if I may so express it, the equipment of the appearing forms, and predisposes all creation to an intelligent appreciation of the true goal of desire and to an intelligent use of the technique of form building in order to reveal divine purpose. The knower man is the custodian of that wisdom which will enable him to further the divine plan and bring the will of God to fruition. The field of knowledge is so constituted that it vibrates with intelligent response to the slowly emerging will. Knowledge itself is that which knows its own ends and works towards those ends through the process of experiment, expectation, experience, examination and exaltation which produces a final exit. Words such as these are synthetic symbols, conveying a cosmic story in terms of constructive brevity. Thus the three rays of will, love and intelligence produce appearance, donate quality and, through the life principle which is the underlying aspect of unity, ensure continuity of growth until such time as the will of God has evidenced itself as power, has attracted to itself the desired, has with wisdom utilized the experience of a gradually growing satisfaction, and has intelligently applied the gain of experience to the production of forms more sensitive, more beautiful and more fully expressive of the quality of the life. Each of these rays is dual in time and space, though only the second ray is dual when they are regarded from the standpoint of the final abstraction. In their temporary duality can be seen, for each of them, the interplay which we call cause and effect. Ray I, will, dynamically applied, emerges in manifestation as power. Ray II, love, magnetically functioning, produces wisdom. Ray three. Intelligence, potentially found in substance, causes activity. The result of the interplay of these three major rays can be seen in the activity of the four minor rays. The secret doctrine speaks of the lords of knowledge and of love, and also of the lords of ceaseless devotion. We might, in order more clearly to understand the mystical significance of these names, point out that the dynamic persistent will of the Logos expresses itself through the lords of ceaseless devotion. Here devotion is not the quality to which I referred earlier in this treatise, but is the persistent directed one-pointed will of God, embodied in a life which is that of the Lord of the First Ray. The lords of love and of knowledge are the two great lives who embody or ensoul the love wisdom and the creative intelligence aspects of the two major rays. These three are the sum total of all forms or appearances, the givers of all qualities, and the emerging life aspect behind the tangible manifestations. They correspond, in the human family, to the three aspects of personality, soul and monad. The monad is dynamic will or purpose, but remains unrevealed until after the third initiation. The monad is life, the sustaining force, a lord of persevering and ceaseless devotion to the pursuit of a seen and determined objective. The soul is a lord of love and wisdom, whilst the personality is a lord of knowledge and of intelligent activity. This use of terms involves the realization of an achieved goal. It is not true of the present stage as regards expression, for this is the intermediate stage. None are as yet working with full intelligent activity, though some day each will do so. None are as yet manifesting lords of love, but they sense the ideal and are striving towards its expression. 
None are as yet lords of ceaseless will and none realize as yet the plan of the monad nor the true goal towards which all are striving. Some day all will. But potentially every human unit is all these three, and some day the appearances which were called personalities, that mask or veil reality, will fully reveal the qualities of deity. When that time comes, the purpose for which all creation waits will burst upon the awakened vision, and we shall know the true meaning of bliss, and why the morning stars sang together. Joy is the strong basic note of our particular solar system. One of the foundational septennate of rays embodies in itself the principle of harmony, and this fourth ray of harmony gives to all forms that which produces beauty and works towards the harmonizing of all effects emanating from the world of causes, which is the world of the three major rays. The ray of beauty of art and harmony is the producer of the quality of organization through form. It is in the last analysis the ray of mathematical exactitude and is not the ray of the artist, as so many seem to think. The artist is found on all rays, just as is the engineer or the physician, the homemaker or the musician. I want to make this clear, for there is much misunderstanding on this matter. Each of the great rays has a form of teaching truth to humanity which is its unique contribution, and in this way develops man by a system or technique which is qualified by the ray quality and is therefore specific and unique. Let me point out to you the modes of this group teaching. Ray I. Higher expression. The science of statesmanship, of government. Lower expression. Modern diplomacy and politics. Ray II. Higher expression. The process of initiation as taught by the hierarchy of adepts. Lower expression. Religion. Ray III. Higher expression. Means of communication or interaction. The radio. Telephone, telegraph and the power to travel. Lower expression, the use and spread of money and gold. Ray IV, higher expression, the Masonic work, based on the formation of the hierarchy. And related to the second ray. Lower expression, architectural construction. Modern city planning. Ray V, higher expression, the science of the soul. Esoteric psychology. Lower expression. Modern educational systems and mental science. Ray V. Higher expression. Christianity and diversified religions. Notice here. Relation to Ray II. Lower expression. Churches and organized religions. Ray VII. Higher expression. All forms of white magic. Lower expression. Spiritualism of phenomena. The fourth ray is essentially the refiner, the producer of perfection within the form, and the prime manipulator of the energies of God in such a way that the temple of the Lord is indeed known in its true nature as that which houses the light. Thus the Shekinah will shine forth within the secret place of the temple in its full glory. Such is the work of the seven builders. This ray is expressive primarily on the first the formless planes, counting from below upwards, and its true purpose cannot emerge until the soul is awakened and consciousness is adequately recording the known. The planes or manifested spheres of expression are influenced in manifestation in a numerical order. Ray I. Will or power. Plane of divinity. Ray II. Love wisdom. Plane of the monad. Ray III. Active intelligence. Plane of spirit, atma. Ray IV. Harmony. Plane of the intuition. Ray V. Concrete knowledge. Mental plane. Ray V. Devotion, idealism. Astral plane. Ray 7. Ceremonial order. Physical plane. Co the fifth ray therefore works actively on the plane of the greatest moment to humanity, being, for man, the plane of the soul, and of the higher and the lower mind. It embodies the principle of knowledge, and because of its activity and its close relation to the third ray of active intelligence might be regarded as a ray having a most vital relation to man at this time in particular. It is the ray which, when active, as it was in Lemurian times, produces individualization, which is literally the shifting of the evolving life of God into a new sphere of awareness. This particular transference into higher forms of awareness tends, at the beginning, to separativeness. 
The fifth ray has produced what we call science. In science we find a condition which is rare in the extreme. Science is separative in its approach to the differing aspects of the divine manifestation which we call the world of natural phenomena, but it is non-separative in actuality, for there is little warring between the sciences and little competition between scientists. In this the workers in the scientific field differ profoundly from those of the religious. The reason for this is to be found in the fact that the true scientist, being a coordinated personality and working therefore on mental levels, works very close to the soul. The developed personality produces the clear distinctions of the dominant lower mind, but, if one may use such a symbolic way of expression, the close proximity of the soul negates a separative attitude. The religious man is pre-eminently astral or emotional and works in a more separative manner, particularly in this Piscean age which is passing away. When I say the religious man I refer to the mystic and to the man who senses the beatific vision. I refer not to disciples nor to those who are called initiates, for they add to the mystical vision a trained mental apprehension. The sixth ray of devotion embodies the principle of recognition. By this I mean the capacity to see the ideal reality lying behind the form. This implies a one-pointed application of desire and of intelligence in order to produce an expression of that sensed idea. It is responsible for much of the formulation of the ideas which have led man on, and for much of the emphasis on the appearance which has veiled and hidden those ideals. It is on this ray primarily, as it cycles in and out of manifestation, that the work of distinguishing between appearance and quality is carried forward, and this work has its field of activity upon the astral plane. The complexity of this subject and the acuteness of the feeling evolved become therefore apparent. The seventh ray of ceremonial order or magic embodies a curious quality which is the outstanding characteristic of the particular life which ensouls this ray. It is the quality or principle which is the coordinating factor unifying the inner quality and the outer tangible form or appearance. This work goes on primarily on etheric levels and involves physical energy. This is the true magical work. I should like to point out that when the fourth ray and the seventh ray come into incarnation together, we shall have a most peculiar period of revelation and of light bringing. It is said of this time that then, the temple of the Lord will take on an added glory and the builders will rejoice together. This will be the high moment of the Masonic work. Spiritually understood. The lost word will then be recovered and uttered for all to hear, and the Master will arise and walk among his builders in the full light of the glory which shines from the East. The spiritualizing of forms might be regarded as the main work of the seventh ray, and it is this principle of fusion, of coordination and a blending which is active on etheric levels every time a soul comes into incarnation and a child is born on earth. D. The soul is the principle of sentiency, underlying all outer manifestation, pervading all forms, and constituting the consciousness of God Himself. When the soul, immersed in substance, is simply sentiency, it produces through its evolutionary interplay and addition, and we find emerging quality and capacity to react to vibration and to environment. This is the soul as it expresses itself in all the subhuman kingdoms in nature. When the soul, an expression of sentiency and quality, adds to these the capacity of detached self-awareness, there appears that self-identified entity which we call a human being. When the soul adds to sentiency, quality and self-awareness, the consciousness of the group, then we have identification with a ray group, and there appears the disciple, the initiate and the master. When the soul adds to sentiency, quality, self-awareness and group consciousness, a consciousness of divine synthetic purpose, called by us the plan, then we have that state of being and knowledge which is distinctive of all upon the path of initiation, and includes those graded lives, from the more advanced disciple up to the planetary logos himself. But forget not that when we make these distinctions it is nevertheless one soul that is functioning, acting through vehicles of varying capacities, of differentiated refinements and of greater and lesser limitations, in just the same sense as a man is one identity, working sometimes through a physical body and sometimes through a feeling body or a mental body, and sometimes knowing himself to be the self, a rare and unusual occurrence for the majority. Every form in manifestation does two things. 
one appropriates or is pervaded by as much of the world soul as its capacity will permit the atom of substance the molecule or the cell all have soul but not in the same degree as has an animal and an animal has soul but not in the same degree as has a master and so on up or down the scale two through the interaction between the indwelling soul and the form two things occur a Sentiency and quality are expressed according to the type of body and its point of evolution. b. The pervading soul drives the body nature into activity, and forces it forward along the path of development, and thus provides for the soul a field of experience and for the body the opportunity to react to the higher soul impulse. Thus the field of expression is benefited, and the soul masters the technique of contact which is its objective in any particular form. The soul therefore, viewed from one angle, is an aspect of the body, for there is a soul in every atom comprising all bodies in all kingdoms in nature. The subtle coherent soul which is the result of the bringing together of spirit and matter exists as an entity apart from the body nature, and constitutes, when separated from the body, the etheric body, the double, as it is sometimes called, or the counterpart of the physical body. This is the sum total of the soul of the atoms constituting the physical body. It is the true form, it is the principle of coherence in every form. The soul, in relation to the human being, is the mind principle in two capacities, or the mind expressing itself in two ways. These two ways are registered and become part of the organized equipment of the human body when it is adequately refined and sufficiently developed. 1. The lower concrete mind, the mental body, the chitta, or mind stuff. 2 the higher spiritual or abstract mind. These two aspects of the soul, its two basic qualities, bring into being the human kingdom and enable man to contact both the lower kingdoms in nature and the higher spiritual realities. The first, the quality of mind in its lower manifestation, is owned potentially by every atom in every form in every kingdom in nature. It is a part of the body nature, inherent and potential, and is the basis of brotherhood, of absolute unity, of universal synthesis and divine coherence in manifestation. The other, the higher aspect, is the principle of self-awareness, and when combined with the lower aspect produces the self-consciousness of the human being. When the lower aspect has informed and pervaded the forms in the subhuman kingdoms, and when it has worked upon those forms and their latent sentiency so as to produce adequate refinement and sentiency, the vibration becomes so potent that the higher is attracted and there is a fusion or at one ing. This is like a higher recapitulation of the initial union of spirit and matter which brought the world into being. A human soul is thus brought into existence and begins its long career. It is now a differentiated entity. Soul, also is a word used to express the sum total of the psychic nature, the vital body, the emotional nature and the mind stuff. But it is also more than that, once the human stage is reached. It constitutes the spiritual entity, a conscious psychical being, a son of God, possessing life, quality and appearance, a unique manifestation in time and space of the three expressions of the soul as we have just outlined them. 1. The soul of all the atoms, composing the tangible appearance. 2. The personal soul or the subtle coherent sum total which we call the personality, composed of the subtle bodies, etheric or vital, astral or emotional, and the lower mental apparatus. These three vehicles humanity shares with the animal kingdom as regards its possession of vitality, sentiency, and potential mind with the vegetable kingdom as regards vitality and sentiency, and with the mineral kingdom as regards vitality and potential sentiency. 3. The soul is also the spiritual being, or the union of life and quality. When there is the union of the three souls, so called, we have a human being. Thus in man you have the blending or fusion of life, quality and appearance, or spirit, soul and body, through the medium of a tangible form. In the process of differentiation these various aspects have attracted attention, and the underlying synthesis has been overlooked or disregarded. Yet all forms are differentiations of the soul, but that soul is one soul, when viewed and considered spiritually.
When studied from the form side, not but differentiation and separation can be seen. When studied from the consciousness or sentiency aspect, unity emerges. When the human stage is reached and self-awareness is blended with the sentiency of forms and with the tiny consciousness of the atom, some idea of a possible subjective unity begins dimly to dawn on the thinker's mind. When the stage of discipleship is reached, a man begins to see himself as a sentient part of a sentient whole, and slowly reacts to the purpose and intent of that whole. He grasps that purpose little by little as he swings consciously into the rhythm of the sum total of which he is a part. When more advanced stages and more rarefied and refined forms are possible, the part is lost in the whole. The rhythm of the whole subjects the individual to a uniform participation in the synthetic purpose, but the realization of individual self-awareness persists and enriches the individual contribution, which is now intelligently and willingly offered, so that the form not only constitutes an aspect of the sum total, which has always and inevitably been the case, even when unrealized. But the conscious thinking entity knows the fact of the unity of consciousness and of the synthesis of life. Thus we have three things to bear in mind as we read and study. 1. The synthesis of life. Spirit. 2. The unity of consciousness. Soul. 3. The integration of forms. Body. These three always have been at one, but the human consciousness has not known it. It is the realization of these three factors and their integration into the technique of living which is, for man, the objective of his entire evolutionary experience. Let us, talking necessarily in symbols, consider the universal soul, or the consciousness of the Logos who brought our universe into being. Let us regard the deity as pervading the form of his solar system with life, and as being conscious of his work, of his project and his goal. This solar system is an appearance, but God remains transcendent. Within all forms God is immanent, yet persists aloof and withdrawn. Just as a thinking, intelligent human being functions through his body but dwells primarily in his mental consciousness or in his emotional processes, so God dwells withdrawn in his mind nature, the world that he has created and pervaded with his life, goes forward towards the goal for which he has created it. Within, however, the radius of his appearing form, greater activities are going forward, varying states of consciousness and stages of awareness are to be seen, developing degrees of sentiency emerge, and even in the symbolism of the human form we have such differing states of sentiency as are registered by the hair, by the internal organisms in the body, by the nervous system, by the brain, and by the entity we call the self, who registers emotion and thought. In the same way does the deity, within the solar system, express as wide a divergence of consciousness. There is a body consciousness, there is a sensory apparatus, registering reaction to the environment, there is a consciousness of moods, of quality, of mental reactions to a world of ideas, there is a higher consciousness of plan and of purpose, there is a consciousness of life. It is interesting to note in connection with the deity that this sensory response to environment provides the entire basis for astrology and for the effect of the constellations upon the solar system and the interplanetary forces. We might sum it all up in relation to man as follows. Man's form nature reacts in its consciousness to the form nature of deity. The outer garment of the soul, physical, vital and psychic, is part of the outer garment of God. Man's self-conscious soul is on rapport with the soul of all things. It is an integral part of the universal soul, and because of this can become aware of the conscious purpose of deity, can intelligently cooperate with the will of God, and thus work with the plan of evolution. Man's spirit is one with the life of God and is within him, deep-seated in his soul, as his soul is seated within the body. This spirit will in some distant time put him on rapport with that aspect of God which is transcendent, and thus each son of God will eventually find his way to that center, withdrawn and abstracted, where God dwells beyond the confines of the solar system. These are words which are formulated in an endeavor to convey an idea of order, of plan, of universal synthesis, of the integration and incorporation of the fragment in the whole, and of the part with the all. Let us endeavor now to answer the second question, remembering as we proceed, 
that it is not possible for us to do more than enter symbolically into the practical purposes of deity. As I write for simple aspirants, I cannot convey the truth until such time as their rapport with their own souls is complete, or more complete than is now the case. The effort, however, to grasp that which cannot be expressed in words produces a downpouring of the abstract mind or of the intuition, and this, in its turn, stimulates and develops the brain cells and produces a steady stabilization of the power to stand in, spiritual being, then it becomes possible to grasp the inexpressible and to live by its power. Question 2. What are the origin, goal, purpose and plan of the soul? The seven rays are the sum total of the divine consciousness, of the universal mind. They might be regarded as seven intelligent entities through whom the plan is working out. They embody divine purpose, express the qualities required for the materializing of that purpose, and they create the forms and are the forms through which the divine idea can be carried forward to completion. Symbolically, they may be regarded as constituting the brain of the divine heavenly man. They correspond to the ventricles of the brain, to the seven centers within the brain, to the seven centers of force, and to the seven major glands which determine the quality of the physical body. They are the conscious executors of divine purpose. They are the seven breaths, animating all forms which have been created by them to carry out the plan. It may perhaps be easier to understand the relation of the seven rays to deity if we remember that man himself, being made in the image of God, is a seven-fold being, capable of seven states of consciousness, expressive of the seven principles or basic qualities which enable him to be aware of the seven planes upon which he is, consciously or unconsciously, functioning. He is a septenate at all times, but his objective is to be consciously aware of all the states of being, to express consciously all the qualities, and to function freely on all the planes. The seven ray beings, unlike man, are fully conscious and entirely aware of the purpose and the plan. They are ever in deep meditation, and have reached the point where, through their advanced stage of development, they are impelled toward fulfillment. They are fully self-conscious and group conscious, they are the sum total of the universal mind, they are awake and active. Their goal and their purpose is such that it is idle for us to speculate about it, for the highest point of achievement for man is the lowest point for them. These seven rays, breaths and heavenly men have the task of wrestling with matter in order to subjugate it to divine purpose, and the goal, as far as one can sense it, is to subject the material forms to the play of the life aspect, thus producing those qualities which will carry the will of God to completion. They are therefore the sum total of all the souls within the solar system, and their activity produces all forms, according to the nature of the form so will be the grade of consciousness. Through the seven rays, the life or spirit aspect flows, cycling through every kingdom in nature and producing thus all states of consciousness in all fields of awareness. For the purpose of this treatise students will have to accept the hypothesis that every human being is swept into manifestation on the impulse of some ray, and is colored by that particular ray quality, which determines the form aspect, indicates the way he should go, and enables him, by the time the third initiation is reached, to have sensed and then to have cooperated with his ray purpose. After the third initiation he begins to sense the synthetic purpose towards which all the seven rays are working, but as this treatise is written for aspirants and disciples, and not for initiates of the third degree, it is needless to speculate upon this ultimate destiny. The human soul is a synthesis of material energy, qualified by intelligent consciousness, plus the spiritual energy which is, in its turn, qualified by one of the seven ray types. Thus the human being emerges, a son of God incarnate in form, with one hand, as the old commentary says, holding firmly to the rock of matter and with the other hand plunged into a sea of love. An ancient scripture puts it thus. When the right hand of the man of matter grasps the flower of life and plucks it for himself, the left hand remains in emptiness. When the right hand of the man of matter grasps the golden lotus of the soul, the left descends seeking the flower of life, though he seeks it not for selfish ends. When the right hand holds the golden lotus firm and the left hand grasps the flower of life, man finds himself to be the seven-leaved plant which flowers on earth and flowers before the throne of God.
The purpose of deity, as it is known to the Creator, is totally unknown to all save the higher initiates. But the purpose of each ray life may be sensed and defined, subject of course to the limitations of the human mind and to the inadequacy of words. The planned activity of every ray qualifies every form found within its body of manifestation. We come now to a technical statement which must be accepted for the sake of argument, being incapable of proof. All the lords of the rays create a body of expression, and thus the seven planets have come into being. These are their major expressions. The Sun, veiling Vulcan. Jupiter. Saturn. Mercury. Venus. Mars. The Moon. The energies of these seven lives however are not confined to their planetary expressions, but sweep around the confines of the solar system just as the life impulses of a human being, his vital forces, his desire impulses, and his mental energies, sweep throughout his body, bringing the various organs into activity and enabling him to carry out his intent, to live his life, and to fulfill the objective for which he created his body of manifestation. Each of the seven kingdoms in nature reacts to the energy of some particular ray life. Each of the seven planes similarly reacts. Each septenate in nature vibrates to one or another of the initial septenates, for the seven rays establish that process which assigns the limits of influence of all forms. They are that which determines all things, and when I use these words I indicate the necessity of law. Law is the will of the seven deities, making its impression upon substance in order to produce a specific intent through the method of the evolutionary process. Of the three rays of aspect. We shall now express the ray purpose in the form of an ancient teaching preserved on leaves that are so old that the writing is slowly fading. I now translate it into modern language though much is lost thereby. The first purpose of deity ray I will or power. Behind the central sacred sun, hidden within its rays, a form is found. Within that form there glows a point of power which vibrates not as yet but shines as light electric. Fierce are its rays. It burns all forms, yet touches not the life of God incarnate. From the one who is the seven goes forth a word. That word reverberates along the line of fiery essence, and when it sounds within the circle of the human lives it takes the form of affirmation, an uttered fiat or word of power. Thus there is impressed upon the living mold the thought of dot 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 dot, the hidden, inexpressible ray name. Let dynamic power, electric light, reveal the past, destroy the form that is, and open up the golden door. This door reveals the way which leads towards the center where dwells the one whose name cannot be heard within the confines of our solar sphere. His robe of blue veils his eternal purpose, but in the rising and the setting sun his orb of red is seen. His word is power, his light electric, the lightning is his symbol. His will is hidden in the counsel of his thought, not as revealed. His power is felt. The sons of men, reacting to his power, send to the utmost bounds of light a question. Why this blind power? Why death? Why this decay of forms? Why the negation of the power to hold? Why death, O mighty Son of God? Faintly the answer comes, I hold the keys of life and death. I bind and loose again. I, the destroyer, am. This Ray Lord is not yet in full expression, except as he causes destruction and brings cycles to an end. The monads of power are much fewer in number than any others. Egos upon the power ray are relatively not so few. They are characterized by a dynamic will, and their power within the human family works out as the force of destruction, but in the last analysis it is a destruction that will produce liberation. We shall see as we continue to study first-ray egos and personalities that death and destruction are always to be found in their work, and hence the apparent cruelty and impersonality of their reactions. Form does not count with first-ray types their energy produces death to form, but ushers in great periods of cyclic pralaya. The first ray is the controller of the death drama in all kingdoms, a destruction of forms which brings about release of power and permits, entrance into light through the gateway of death. The intent of the Lord of the First Ray is to stand behind his six brothers, and when they have achieved their purpose, to shatter the forms which they have built. 
This he does by passing his power through their bodies, and their united effort leads to abstraction and a return to the center whence the initial impulse came. The first ray purpose therefore is to produce death, and some idea of that purpose may be gleaned if we study some of the names by which the ray lord is called. The lord of death. The opener of the door. The liberator from form the great abstractor. The fiery element, producing shattering the crystallizer of the form. The power that touches and withdraws the lord of the burning ground the will that breaks into the garden the ravisher of souls. The finger of God. The breath that blasts. The lightning which annihilates the Most High. The qualities and characteristics of this Lord who brings release may be gathered from the following six aphorisms which, an ancient legend says, his six brothers gave to him, as they begged him to hold his hand till they had had time to work out their purposes. 1. Kill out desire when desire has fulfilled its work. Thou art the one who indicates fulfillment. Quality. Clear vision. 2. Seek out the gentle way, O Lord of power. Wait for thy brother on the path of love. He builds the forms that can withstand thy power. Quality. Dynamic power. 3. Withhold the hand until the time has come. Then give the gift of death, O opener of the door. Quality. Sense of time. 4. Stand not alone, but with the many join thyself. Thou art the one, the isolated. Come forth unto thine own. Quality. Solitariness. 5. Let thine own forth but learn to know thine own. Hate not attachment but see its plan and purpose. Quality. Detachment. 6. Through thee the life pulsates, the rhythm is imposed. The life is all. Love life in all its forms. Quality. Singleness of purpose. The six qualities enumerated above express the force of this ray as it makes its presence felt in the fourth kingdom in nature. The effects in other kingdoms differ, but we shall confine our attention to the standpoint of humanity. The purpose of the first ray, and its main work, is to produce cessation and the death of all forms in all kingdoms in nature and on all planes. The energy of this ray lord brings about the death of an ant or of a solar system, of an organization, a religion, or a government, of a race type or of a planet. His will or purpose works out through the law of periodicity. The second purpose of deity. Ray 2. Love wisdom. The word is issuing from the heart of God, emerging from a central point of love. That word is love itself. Divine desire colors all that life of love. Within the human hierarchy, the affirmation gathers power and sound. The word in the beginning was. The word hath dwelt and dwells with God. In him was light. In him was life. Within his light we walk. His symbol is the thunder, the word that cycles down the ages. Some of the names of this Ray Lord which convey his purpose are as follows. The Displayer of Glory. The Lord of Eternal Love. The Cosmic Magnet. The Giver of Wisdom. The Radiance in the Form. The Master Builder. The Conferrer of Names. The Great Geometrician. The One Who Hides the Life. The Cosmic Mystery. The Light Bringer. The Son of God Incarnate. The Cosmic Christ. The legend tells us that the six brothers summarize his qualities in the following aphorisms. 1. Send forth the word and speak the radiant love of God. Make all men hear. Quality, love divine. 2. Let the glory of the Lord shine forth. Let there be radiant light as well as radiant love. Quality, radiance. 3. Draw to thyself the object of thy search. Pull forth into the light of day from out the night of time the one thou lovest. Quality, attraction. 4. When light and love are shown forth then let the power within produce the perfect flower. Let the word that heals the form go forth. That secret word that then must be revealed. Quality, dot the power to save. 5. Salvation, light, and love, with the magnetic power of God, produce the word of wisdom. Send forth that word, and lead the sons of men from off the path of knowledge on to the path of understanding. Quality, wisdom. 6. 
Within the radius of the love of God, within the circle of the solar system, all forms, all souls, all lives revolve. Let each son of God enter into this wisdom. Reveal to each the oneness of the many lives. Quality. Expansion or inclusiveness. The third ray, which is one that has a very long cycle, having been in manifestation since AD 1425, has a direct effect upon the fifth root race, the Aryan, and has connected with it a set of curious phrases which express its purpose. The third purpose of deity. Ray 3. Active intelligence or adaptability. Let the Warden of the South continue with the building. Let him apply the force which will produce the shining living stone that fits into the temple's plan with right exactitude. Let him prepare the corner stone and wisely place it in the north, under the eye of God himself, and subject to the balance of the triangle. Let the researcher of the past uncover the thought of God, hidden deep within the mind of the Kumaras of love, and thus let him lead the Agnishvatvas, waiting within the place of darkness, into the place of light. Let the keeper of the sparks breathe with the breath divine upon the points of fire, and let him kindle to a blaze that which is hidden, that which is not seen, and so illumine all the spheres whereon God works. I would call attention to the fact that all I can do here is to put into words certain ancient symbols, and so emphasize the process, adopted by the early initiate teachers, of enunciating a word or sound, which produces a symbolic form, which in its turn, is capable of translation into words. These must in their turn be comprehended intuitively and adapted to individual need, and thus be assimilated into the life practice. Otherwise these ancient and interesting ideas, these interpretive names, and these aphorisms, conveying the power of qualities, are worse than useless and serve but to increase responsibility. The capacity to see objective significances and then apply them to life is an expression of the true esoteric sense. If one studies these tabulations and phrases with care, they will be found to convey indication as to one's individual ray, life tendencies and purpose, if the appeal the various statements make anent a particular ray evoke an intuitive understanding on the part of the student, so that he recognizes himself, his ray energy and aspects of his latent and deeply desired spiritual nature, then these communications I am making here as to purpose, name and quality will be profitable and useful. Some of the names of the Lord of the Third Ray indicate his use of force and his real nature. They are as follows. The Keeper of the Records. The Lord of Memory. The Unifier of the Lower Four, the Interpreter of that which is seen, the Lord of Balance. The Divine Separator. The Discriminating Essential Life, the One who Produces Alliance, the Three Sided Triangle, the Illuminator of the Lotus, the Builder of the Foundation, the Forerunner of the Light, the One who Veils and Yet Reveals, the Dispenser of Time. The Lord of Space. The Universal Mind. The Threefold Wick the great architect of the universe", and many others terms which indicate relation to light, to time, to space, to the manifested logos, to matter and to the power which evokes the form. If all these names are studied in connection with modern developments or modern culture and science, it will become apparent how potent and influential in our day and time is this particular ray life, and how his energies, having produced the tangible objective worlds, are turned to the manifestation of our modern civilization, with its material emphasis, its search as to the nature of time and space, and that mental unfoldment which it is the glory and the destiny of our particular race to demonstrate. The qualities which characterize this Ray Lord might be enumerated in the following phrases. We must bear in mind that the seventh or synthetic characteristic of each of the rays is denoted by the Ray name and is not specifically stated in the other six qualities. His six brothers, sons of the one father, chanted these injunctions to him on the day of his renewed activity, on what we call the day of creation. 1. Produce the dual form and veil the life. Let form appear, and prove itself divine. All is of God. Quality. Dot the power to manifest. 2. Conform the shell to that which dwells within. Let the world egg appear. Let ages pass, then let the soul appear. Let life emerge within a destined time. Quality. Dot the power to evolve. 3. Let mind control. 
Let the clear shining of the Son of Life reveal the mind of God, and set the Shining One upon His way. Then lead Him to the central point where all is lost within the Light Supernal. Quality, Mental Illumination. 4. God and His Form are One. Reveal this fact, O Sovereign Lord of Form. God and His Form are One. Negate the dual concept. Lend color to the form. The life is one, the harmony complete. Prove thus the two are one. Quality. The power to produce synthesis on the physical plane. 5. Produce the garment of the Lord, set forth the robe of many colors. Then separate that robe from that which hides behind its many folds. Take off the veiling sheaths. Let God be seen. Take Christ from off the cross. Quality. Scientific investigation. 6. Let the two paths converge. Balance the pairs of opposites and let the path appear between the two. God and the path and man are one. Quality, balance. Thus the three major rays sum up in themselves the process of creation, of energizing, through the urge of the divine will, and the work of the four minor rays, as they are called, though with no idea of their being lesser or greater, is to elaborate or differentiate the qualities of the life, and so produce the infinite multiplicity of forms which will enable the life to assume its many points of focus and express, through the process of evolutionary manifestation, its diverse characteristics. Be the four rays of attribute. The fourth purpose of deity. Ray IV. Harmony, beauty, art. Color and yet no color now is seen. Sound and the soundless one meet in an infinite point of peace. Time and the timeless one negate the thoughts of men. But time is not. Form is there found, and yet the psychic sense reveals that which the form is powerless to hide, the inner synthesis, the all-embracing prism, that point of unity which, when it is duly reached, reveals a further point where all the three are one, and not the two alone. Form and its soul are merged. The inner vision watches o'er the fusion, knows the divine relation and sees the two as one. But from that point of high attainment, a higher vision blazes forth. Before the opened inner eye. The three are one, and not alone the two. Pass on, O pilgrim on the way. In reading these words, the student must bear in mind that the antechamber has been left behind and man stands, when he has allowed the fourth ray to do its work and can therefore function on the fourth or buddhic plane, within the temple of the Lord. He has found a measure of light, but in that light he now sees light, and visions a greater revelation and brilliance. This now becomes the object of his search. He has mastered the uses of duality and has learned to at one soul and body into one instrument for spirit. Now he passes on his way to achieve the greater synthesis. The Lord of the Fourth Ray has many names which warrant careful study and much consideration. In less than a hundred years this Lord of Harmonizing Power will have more influence and will offset some of the Saturn disruption of the first decanate of Aquarius. In the meantime a study of his names will produce a simplification of his efforts and build up a body of constructive thought which will facilitate his work when he is again in active manifestation. He is always, however, more or less in power where the human family is concerned, for there is a numerical alliance between the fourth ray, the fourth creative hierarchy, or the human monads, and the fourth kingdom in nature. His power is always consequently active. The Perceiver on the Way The link between the three and three the divine intermediary. The Hand of God. The Hidden One. The seed, that is the flower. The mountain whereon form dies the light within the light. The corrector of the form. The one who marks the parting of the way the master. The dweller in the holy place. The lower than the three, the highest of the four the trumpet of the Lord. The aphorisms connected with this fourth ray are not easy of comprehension. They require an exercise of the intuition and are conveyed by six short and excessively brief commands uttered, curiously enough, late in the creative period and at the time when the fourth creative hierarchy came into incarnation. 1. Speak low the word. Speak low. Quality. Power to penetrate the depths of matter. 2. Champion desire. Give what is needed to the seeker. Quality. 
the dual aspects of desire. 3. Lower the thread. Unfold the way. Link man with God. Arise. Quality. Power to reveal the path. 4. All flowers are thine. Settle the roots in mud, the flowers in sun. Prove mud and sun and roots and flowers are one. Quality. Power to express divinity. Growth. 5. Roll and return and roll again. Cycle around the circle of the heavens. Prove all as one. Quality. Dot the harmony of the spheres. 6. Color the sound. Sound forth the color. Produce the notes and see them pass into the shades, which in their turn produce the sounds. Thus all are seen as one. Quality. Dot the synthesis of true beauty. This instruction on the rays is of deeper significance than can as yet be comprehended. Careful systematic study and a sane refraining from the forming of rapid deductions will be the wisest way in which to approach its consideration. It is not possible for me to deal with the definite human psychological applications at this early stage. I am occupied with starting a general outline, with the impartation of ideas, with the grounding of a few basic concepts in the consciousness of the reader, and with an attempt to clothe this most abstruse and difficult subject in such a form that some new rhythm of thought may be set in motion, and some new realizations be grasped and held. These concern at present a prototypal cosmic process, and will lead eventually to an understanding of the part an individual may play in a stupendous cosmic whole. We begin with the universal and end with the particular, which is ever the truly occult method. However, all that I am positing about a ray life may be equally well posited anent a human life, but it should be borne in mind that the pure ray type does not as yet exist, for there is not to be found that perfect form, mechanism or expression of the ray quality, nor that absolutely purified appearance in the human family, except in such rare cases as the Buddha, or Christ, and, in another field of expression, an Alexander or Julius Caesar. Leonardo da Vinci was an analogous expression. The rays concern energy and consciousness, and determine expression, but where the matter utilized and the vehicle informed is as yet imperfectly evolved, there is then limitation and the tuning out, automatically of much of the energy. The effect of ray force, working through imperfect forms, must be distorted and curtailed and misapplied. Let me illustrate. I have said that first ray energy works out as the destruction of forms, it must be remembered that a pure destroyer is utterly unknown, and mercifully for the race this is so. It is a beneficent condition that as yet a first-ray ego is so handicapped and limited by the form nature and the quality of that form nature that it is unable to make adequate or intelligent use of its destructive force. First-ray personalities are oft destructive, as well you know, but the energy generated is insufficient to work much harm. Again, pure love is incapable of expression today, its flow being impeded by the form nature. A consideration of these two cases will help the reader to appreciate the situation. But the time is near at hand wherein there will be a fuller expression of ray purpose, type or quality, and therefore a truer appearance. This is owing to the imminent appearance, or manifestation, of certain great lives who will embody the energy of rays 2, 3, 5 and 7. They will thus constitute focal points for the inflow of these four types of divine energy and, this will produce a tremendous stimulation of their corresponding and responding units of life. These four beings, who will appear as human beings in the field of the modern world, may be looked for before the end of this century and their united effort will inaugurate definitely the new age, and usher in the period which will go down in history as the time of glory for the fifth root race. Each of these four masters, for that they will be, is also subjectively the focal point for a triple inflow of energy from the center in the body of God which is symbolically spoken of as the heart of the sun. For each ray is in its turn a triple manifesting entity as is the solar deity himself. Love will be their outstanding characteristic, and through that attractive magnetic force the new forms will come into being which will permit of purer ray types, and thus of more truly expressive appearances. A great deal of the destructive energy extant in the world today is due to the presence on the astral plane of a first-ray disciple of the planetary Logos. His work it is to clear the way for the manifestation of these other four major disciples, who are primarily builders, 
They will enter on their work when the task of the wreckers of form has been accomplished. I should like here to give a suggestion, for it is necessary that some of the methods of the hierarchy should begin to be understood. The work of what in the West is called, the Christ Principle, is to build the forms for the expression of quality and life. That is the characteristic work of the second aspect of divinity. The work of the Antichrist is to destroy forms, and this is essentially the work of the first expression of divinity. But the work of the destroyer is not the work of black magic, and when ignorant humanity regards Antichrist as working on the black side, their error is great. His work is as beneficent as that of the building aspect, and it is but man's hatred of the death of forms which makes him regard the work of the destroyer as black, as being against the divine will, and as subversive of the divine program. The work of the representatives of that mysterious power which we call cosmic evil, and their responding representatives, is indeed worthy of the word black, but it is not applicable to the work of Antichrist. It might be added that the work of the black forces wells up from below, whilst the work of the destroyers is impelled from above. The symbols of these two ways are the sword and the cross. After these preliminary remarks, which are intended to indicate the magnitude of the subject, we shall now proceed to an analysis of the three rays which still remain to be considered. The fifth purpose of deity. Ray v. Concrete knowledge or science. The thunders crash around the mountain top. Dark clouds conceal the form. The mists, arising from the watery sphere, serve to distort the wondrous. Found within the secret place. The form is there. Its note is sounding forth. A beam of light illuminates the form, the hidden now appears. Knowledge of God and how he veils himself finds consummation in the thoughts of man. The energies and forces receive their secret names, reveal their inner purpose, and all is seen as rhythm, a returning on itself. The great scroll can now be read. God's purpose and his plans are fixed, and man can read the form. The plan takes form. The plan is form. Its purpose is the revelation of the mind of God. The past reveals the form, but the present indicates the flowing in of energy. That which is on its way comes as a cloud which veils the sun. But hid behind this cloud of immanence is love, and on the earth is love and in the heaven is love, and this, the love which maketh all things new, must stand revealed. This is the purpose back of all the acts of this great Lord of Knowledge. Before enumerating the names of this great life, I should like to point out that the fifth ray is one of unique and peculiar potency in relation to the human kingdom. The reason is that the fifth plane of mind is the sphere of his major activity and it is on this plane that we find the triple aspects of mind. 1. Abstract or higher mind, the embodiment of a higher triad. 2. The concrete or lower mind, the highest aspect of the lower self. 3. The ego or solar angel, the pure son of mind, who expresses intelligence, both abstractly and concretely, and is the point of unification. This life has also much power today in connection with the fifth root race and with the transference of the consciousness of humanity into the fifth or spiritual kingdom. Students would learn much if they contrasted the building power of the higher mind with the destroying power of the lower. Just as the personality has no other function in the divine plan than to be a channel for, and the medium of expression of, the soul, so the lower mind is intended to be the channel for the pure inflow of higher mind energy. This fifth ray is a being of the intensest spiritual light and in his manifestation on this fifth plane, which is peculiarly his, he symbolizes the three aspects in a way achieved by no other ray. Through his quality of higher mind, this ray is a pure channel for the divine will. Through the septenary grouping of the solar lives on the mental levels whereon they appear, he brought into functioning activity seven corresponding reflections of the seven centers of deity, as far as our planet is concerned, a thing which none of his six brother rays have done. This statement means little to you, but the tremendous sacrifice and effort thus involved are paralleled only by the life of the Buddha, and this is one of the reasons why, in this fifth race, love and mind must eventually and mutually reveal each other. 
Some of the names given to the Lord of this ray are as follows. The Revealer of Truth the Great Connector. The Divine Intermediary the Crystallizer of Forms the Threefold Thinker. The Cloud upon the Mountain Top the Precipitator of the Cross the Dividing Sword. The Winnower of the Chaff the Fifth Great Judge the Rose of God. The Heavenly One. The Door into the Mind of God the Initiating Energy. The ruler of the third heaven the guardian of the door the dispenser of knowledge the angel with the flaming sword the keeper of the secret. The beloved of the logos the brother from Sirius the master of the hierophants. This fifth ray has so many names, owing to his close connection with man, since man was originally created, that it has not been easy to choose those which are of the most use in enabling the student to form an idea of the fifth ray characteristics and mission. But the study of the six aphorisms, and the qualities which they indicate, will show how potent and important is this ray. Lord. These six aphorisms were chanted by his six brothers at that momentous crisis wherein the human family came into existence and the solar angels sacrificed themselves. Esoterically speaking, they went down into hell, and found their place in prison. On that day souls were born. A new kingdom of expression came into being, and the three highest planes and the three lower were brought into a scintillating interchange. 1. God and his angels now arise and see. Let the mountaintops emerge from out the dense wet mist. Let the sun touch their summits and let them stand in light. Shine forth. Quality. Emergence into form and out of form. 2. God and his angels now arise and hear. Let a deep murmur rise and let the cry of seeking man enter into their ears. Let man listen. Let man call. Speak loud. Quality. Power to make the voice of the silence heard. 3. God and his angels now arise and touch. Bring forth the rod of power. Extend it outward toward the sons of men. Touch them with fire, then bring them near. Bring forth. Quality. Initiating activity. 4. God and his angels now arise and taste. Let all experience come. Let all the ways appear. Discern and choose, dissect and analyze. All ways are one. Quality. Revelation of the way. 5. God and his angels now arise and sense the odor rising from the burning ground of man. Let the fire do its work. Draw man within the furnace and let him drop within the rose-red center the nature that retards. Let the fire burn. Quality. Purification with fire. 6. God and his angels now arise and fuse the many in the one. Let the blending work proceed. Let that which causes all to be produce the cause of their cessation. Let one temple now emerge. Produce the crowning glory. So let it be. Quality. Dot the manifestation of the great white light. The Shekinah. A.A.B. There is much of practical usefulness to the reader in a study of these qualities. When he believes himself to be upon a particular ray, they will indicate to him some of the characteristics for which he may look, and perhaps demonstrate to him what he has to do, what he has to express, and what he has to overcome. These qualities should be studied from two angles, their divine aspect and their reverse aspect or the form side. This ray, for instance, is shown to be the revealer of the way, and it should be remembered therefore that this fifth ray reveals the way down into death or into incarnation, which is the death-like prison of the soul, or it reveals the way up and out of darkness into the pure light of God's day. I mention this as I am exceedingly anxious that all who read this treatise should make application of this teaching to their daily lives. I am not interested in imparting weird or unusual items of information anent these matters for the delectation of an unhealthy mental appetite. The stocking of the memory with occult detail which serves no useful purpose only strains the brain cells and feeds the pride. The Sixth Purpose of Deity Ray 6. Devotion or Idealism this ray which is just going out of manifestation, is of vital interest to us, for it has set its mark upon our Western civilization in a more definite way than any of the others. It is for us the most familiar and the best known of the rays. The mantram which defines its purpose as unlike the others and might be expressed somewhat as follows. The crusade is on. The warriors march upon their way. 
They crush and kill all that impedes their way, and aught that rises on their onward path is trampled underfoot. March towards the light. The work goes forward. The workers veil their eyes from pity as from fear. The work is all that counts. The form must disappear so that the loving spirit may enter into rest. Not must arrest the progress of the workers with the plan. They enter upon the work assigned with paean and with song. The cross is reared on high, the form is laid thereon, and on that cross must render up its life. Each builds a cross which forms the cross. They mount upon the cross. Through war, through work, through pain and toil, the purpose is achieved. Thus saith the symbol. It will be noted how this purpose, when applied by man to himself, works his release. When applied by man to man, it has produced the corrupt and awful story of man's cruelty to man. In the above mantram you will find the clue to the sixth ray purpose as it appears in the human kingdom, and a close expansive study, note that paradoxical phrase, of the underlying ideas will reveal a little of the larger purpose. The soul is and should be pitiless to its form and its problem. The soul can, however, comprehend the need for pain and difficulty in the world, for he can extend a knowledge of his own technique with himself to the technique of God with his world, but he does nothing knowingly that could possibly increase the world's pain or sorrow. Some of the names for this beneficent yet somewhat violently energized Lord of Array are as follows. The Negator of Desire the one who sees the right the visioner of reality the divine robber. The devotee of life the hater of forms. The warrior on the march the sword-bearer of the logos the upholder of the truth the crucifier and the crucified the breaker of stones. The imperishable flaming one the one whom not can turn the implacable ruler. The general on the perfect way the one who leads the twelve. Curiously enough, this sixth ray lord has always been a loved enigma to his six brethren. This comes out in the questions which they addressed to him on one occasion when they met, under the eye of the Lord, to interchange their plans for united, divine, harmonious action. They asked these questions in a spirit of heavenly joy and love, but with the intent to throw some light upon the somewhat obscure quality of their loved brother. 1. Why is desire red? Why red is blood? Tell us, O Son of God, why thy way is red with blood? Quality, power to kill out desire. 2. Why do you turn your back upon the sphere of earth? Is it too small, too poor? Why kick it as a ball upon a playing field? Quality, spurning that which is not desired. 3. Why set the cross from earth to heaven? But earth can be a heaven. Why mount the cross and die? Quality, self-immolation. 4. Why battle thus with all that is around? Seek you not peace? Why stand between the forces of the night and day? Why thus unmoved and calm, untired and unafraid? Quality. Endurance and fearlessness. 5. See you not God in all, the life in all, and love in all? Why separate yourself and leave behind the loved and the well-known? Quality. Power to detach oneself. 6. Can you arrest the waters of the sixth great sphere? Can you stem the flood? Can you recover both the raven and the dove? Can you, the fish, swim free? Quality, overcoming the waters of the emotional nature. This outgoing ray of devotion to the ideal, and the incoming ray of magical order or organization are largely responsible for the type of man's consciousness today. Man is essentially devoted, to the point of fanaticism, to whatever may be the goal of his life's attention. This goal may be to achieve discipleship, or to raise a family, or to get money, or to achieve popularity, or any other objective to which he consecrates his time and energy, but whatever it may be, to it he devotes all that he is or has. Man also is essentially and inherently a producer of law and order, though this quality is only just beginning to make its presence felt. This is because mankind is, at last, becoming mentally centered, and hence we have in the world at this time the many and varied attempts to straighten out affairs along business, national, economic, social and other lines, to produce some system and order, and to bring about the rearranging of all energies with the objective, unrealized consciously as yet, of inaugurating the new age.
owing, however, to defective mental control and to an almost universal ignorance as to the laws of thought, and in addition, to a profound lack of knowledge as to man's own nature, man works blindly. The ideals sensed are not correctly interpreted by the mind nor applied in such a way that they are of general and appropriate application. Hence the confusion and the chaotic experimentation going on, and hence also the imposition of personal authority to enforce an individual's idea of the ideal. The need today is for sound teaching as to the laws of thought, and the rules which govern the building of those thought forms which must embody the ideas sent forth from the universal divine mind. Men must begin on the subjective planes of life to work out the needed order. When this is realized, we shall have every important group of men engaged in world affairs, or in the work of government in all its branches, aided on the mental plane by trained thinkers, so that there may be right application and correct adjustment to the plan. This time is as yet far away, and hence the distortions and misrepresentations on earth of the plan as it exists in heaven, to use the Christian phraseology. It was the realization of the present world need for illumined thinkers and subjective workers which prompted those who guide so to direct the incoming spiritual energies that the formation of the esoteric groups everywhere came about. It led also to the publication of the mass of mystical and oriental literature on meditation and allied topics which has flooded the world today. Hence also the effort that I, a worker on the inner side of life, am making to teach the newer psychology in this treatise, and so show to man what is his equipment and how well suited he is to the work for which he has been created, and which he has as yet failed to comprehend. The force and the effect of the seventh ray influence will, however, reveal to him the magical work, and the next 2500 years will bring about so much change and make possible the working of so many so-called miracles, that even the outer appearance of the world will be profoundly altered. The vegetation and the animal life will be modified and developed, and much that is latent in the forms of both kingdoms will be brought into expression through the freer flow and the more intelligent manipulation of the energies which create and constitute all forms. The world has been changed beyond belief during the past 500 years, and during the next 200 years the changes will be still more rapid and deep-seated, for the growth of the intellectual powers of man is gathering momentum, and man, the Creator, is coming into possession of His powers. The Seventh Purpose of Deity Ray 7. Ceremonial Order or Magic Let the Temple of the Lord be built, the Seventh Great Angel cried. Then to their places in the North, the South, the West and East, seven great sons of God moved with measured pace and took their seats. The work of building thus began. The doors were closed. The light shone dim. The temple walls could not be seen. The seven were silent and their forms were veiled. The time had not arrived for the breaking forth of light. The word could not be uttered. Only between the seven forms the work went on. A silent call went forth from each to each. Yet still the temple door stayed shut. As time went on, the sounds of life were heard. The door was opened, and the door was shut. Each time it opened, the power within the temple grew. Each time the light waxed stronger, for one by one the sons of men entered the temple, passed from north to south, from west to east and in the center of the heart found light, found understanding and the power to work. They entered through the door, they passed before the seven, they raised the temple's veil and entered into life. The temple grew in beauty. Its lines, its walls, its decorations, and its height and depth and breadth slowly emerged and entered into light. Out from the east, the word went forth, Open the door to all the sons of men who come from all the darkened valleys of the land and seek the temple of the Lord. Give them the light. Unveil the inner shrine, and through the work of all the craftsmen of the Lord extend the temple's walls and thus irradiate the world. Sound forth the word creative and raise the dead to life. Thus shall the temple of the light be carried from heaven to earth. Thus shall its walls be reared upon the great plains of the world of men. Thus shall the light reveal and nurture all the dreams of men. Then shall the master in the east awaken those who are asleep. Then shall the warden in the west test and try all the true seekers after light. Then shall the warden in the south instruct and aid the blind. Then shall the gate into the north remain wide open. For there the unseen master stands with welcoming hand and understanding heart, 
to lead the pilgrims to the east where the true light shines forth. Why this opening of the temple? Demand the greater seven. Because the work is ready, the craftsmen are prepared. God has created in the light. His sons can now create. What can else be done? Not. Came the answer from the greater seven. Let the work proceed. Let the sons of God create. These words will be noted by many as of deep significance and as indicating a wide intention, during the coming cycle, to open the door wide into the temple of the hidden mystery to man. One by one we shall undergo the esoteric and spiritual counterpart of the psychological factor which is called, a mental test. That test will demonstrate a man's usefulness in mental work and power, it will show his capacity to build thought forms and to vitalize them. This I dealt with in a treatise on white magic, and the relation of that treatise to the magical work of the seventh ray and its cycle of activity will become increasingly apparent. A treatise on white magic is an attempt to lay down the rules for training and for work which will make it possible for the candidate to the mysteries to enter the temple and to take his place as a creative worker and thus aid in the magical work of the Lord of the Temple. The names whereby this ray Lord is known are many, and their meaning is of prime significance today. The work of the future can be seen from a study of these names. The Unveiled Magician. The worker in the magical art the creator of the form. The bestower of light from the second lord the manipulator of the wand. The watcher in the east. The custodian of the seventh plan the invoker of wrath. The keeper of the magical word the temple guardian. The representative of God. The one who lifts to life. The Lord of Death. The one who feeds the sacred fire the whirling sphere. The Sword of the Initiator. The Divine Alchemical Worker the Builder of the Square the Orienting Force the Fiery Unifier. The Key to the Mystery the Expression of the Will the Revealer of Beauty. This Ray Lord has a peculiar power on earth and on the physical plane of divine manifestation. His usefulness to his six brothers is therefore apparent. He makes their work appear. He is the most active of all the rays in this world period, and is never out of manifestation for more than 1500 years. It is almost as if he whirled in and out of active work under a very rapid cycle, and his closest relation, symbolically, is to his brethren of the second and fifth rays in this world period. He builds, using second ray cooperation, through the power of thought, thus cooperating with the Lord of the Fifth Ray and on the physical plane, which is his own essential and peculiar sphere. In another world period his relation with the other Ray Lords may undergo change, but at this time his work will be more easily understood when he is recognized as aiding the building Lord of the Second Ray and utilizing the energies of the Lord of Concrete Thought. The aphorisms embodying his qualities run as follows, and were esoterically whispered into his ears when he left the most high place and descended into the seventh sphere to carry out the work assigned. 1. Take thy tools with thee, brother of the building light. Carve deep. Construct and shape the living stone. Quality. Power to create. 2. Choose well thy workers. Love them all. Pick six to do thy will. Remain the seventh in the east. Yet call the world to enter into that which thou shalt build. Blend all together in the will of God. Quality. Power to cooperate. 3. Sit in the center and the east as well. Move not from there. Send out thy force to do thy will and gather back thy forces. Use well the power of thought. Sit still. Quality. Power to think. 4. See all parts enter into the purpose. Build towards beauty, brother Lord. Make all colors bright and clear. See to the inner glory. Build the shrine well. Use care. Quality. Revelation of the beauty of God. 5. Watch well thy thought. Enter at will into the mind of God. Pluck thence the power, the plan, the part to play. Reveal the mind of God. Quality. Mental power. 6. Stay in the east. The five have given thee a friendly word. I, the sixth, tell thee to use it on the dead. Revive the dead. Build forms anew. Guard well that word. Make all men seek it for themselves. Quality. Power to vivify. Thus we have studied a little the work of the seven rays.
The teaching has had to be conveyed symbolically and its understanding necessitates an awakened esoteric sense. To comprehend it all is not as yet possible. The Chohans of the Sixth Initiation have the guidance of those units of consciousness in whom their particular ray vibration and color predominate. The vast importance of this fact is often overlooked, even when theoretically acknowledged by aspirants to initiation. Hence the importance of determining the ray of the ego and of the monad, something of vital moment after the third initiation. A majority and a minority always exist in every department of life. So it is in the work of the Logos, for at the end of the greater cycle, Manvantara, the majority will find their way to the synthetic love ray. A small minority will find their way to the power ray. This minority are destined for an important function. They will constitute the nucleus which, in the next solar system, will constitute the majority, finding their synthesis on ray 1. This is a great mystery and not easily understood. Some hint towards its solution will be found hidden in the real meaning of the words, exoteric, and esoteric. The fact should be remembered that only five rays dominate at any one time. All manifest, but only five dominate. A distinction should be made between the rays dominating in a solar system and those dominating in a scheme, or a chain. To this reference has been made in a treatise on cosmic fire. Three rays out of the seven synthesize. One ray out of the three will synthesize at the culmination. For the first solar system the third ray was the synthetic ray, but for this solar system the second ray is the synthetic ray, and for the next solar system the first ray will perform a similar function. Two rays are largely the goal of human endeavor, the first ray and the second ray. One ray is the goal of the diva or angel evolution, the third ray. All these three rays contact the two poles, and the attainment of the goal at the end of the cycle marks the achievement of the solar logos. This again is hidden in mystery. The seventh ray and the first ray are very closely allied, with the third ray linking them, so that we have the relation expressed thus, one, three, seven. There is a close association also between rays two, four, six, with the fifth ray in a peculiar position, as a central point of attainment, the home of the ego or soul, the embodied plane of mind, the point of consummation for the personality, and the reflection in the three worlds of the threefold monad. Rei. Will, demonstrating as power in the unfolding of the plan of the Logos. Ray 3. Adaptability of activity with intelligence. This ray was the dominant one in the past solar system, it is the foundation or basis of this system, and is controlled by the Mahachohan. Ray 7. Ceremonial ritual or organization. This is the reflection on the physical plane of the two above, and is likewise connected with the Mahachohan. It controls the elemental forces and the involutionary process and the form side of the three kingdoms in nature. It holds hid the secret of physical color and sound. It is the law. These three rays together embrace and embody all. They are power, activity and the law in manifestation. Ray 2 love and wisdom, the synthetic ray which is the goal for this system, holding all in close harmony and relation. Ray IV, the expression of harmony, beauty, music and unity. Ray V, the ray of devotion to the ardor of aspiration, and of the sacrifice of the personal self for the good of all, with the object in view of harmony and beauty, impelled thereto by love. These two groups of rays might be related to each other as follows. Rays 1, 3, 7 are the great rays connected with the form, with the evolutionary process, with the intelligent functioning of the system, and with the laws controlling the life in all forms in all the kingdoms in nature. Rays 2, 4, 6 are the rays connected with the inner life, expanding through those forms, the rays of motive, aspiration and sacrifice. Rays pre-eminently of quality. Rays 1. 3. 7 deal with things concrete and with the functioning of matter and form from the lowest plane to the highest. Rays 2. 4. 6 deal with things abstract, with spiritual expression through the medium of form. Ray 5. Forms the connecting link of the intelligence. Our third question comes up now for consideration and is as follows. Question 3. Can the fact of the soul be proved? 
The soul has been satisfactorily disproved from the standpoint of academic science. For ages the search has gone on, with the objective of the search, scientifically speaking, being laid on the demonstration of the location of the soul in the human body. That has been the emphasis and the important factor to the scientific mind, which is so different to that of its more mystically inclined brother. All research, especially that carried on lately in connection with the modern materialistic schools and with the fuller understanding of the mechanism of the human body, has tended to prove that the soul is a superstition, a defense mechanism, and that conscious thought with all the higher manifestations of the human mind, and hence also the lower expressions of personality, selfhood and conscious integration, can well be provided for and accounted for by man's present equipment of brain, nervous system and the endocrine system. All these in their turn are understood to be the result of a long evolutionary and selective process. The wonder of the machine itself is divine in its completion and in its scope. From a primeval germ, developing under the pressure of nature's laws, and of environing conditions plus a consistent adaptation to requirements and a most careful selection, man has developed. He now possesses a mechanism which is responsive to the natural world, to sensation and to thought. That which is called the soul is regarded frequently as the result of this selective process and as constituting the sum total of the responsive and discriminating powers of the cells and organs of the body, plus the life principle. All, we are told, is inherent in the parental germ, and the conditions of the environment, added to heredity and education, are sufficient to account for the phenomena of the human consciousness. Man is a machine, a part of a still greater machine which we call nature, and both man and nature are run on immutable laws. There is no free will except within certain clearly defined limits, which are defined by equipment and by circumstance. There can be no immortality, for when the machine breaks down and disintegrates there is nothing left but the dissociated cells and atoms of which it was originally composed. When the principle of coherence or of integration ceases to function, that which it produced, the coherent functioning body, likewise ceases to function. Consciousness and choice, awareness and affection, thought and temperament, life and love, character and capacities, all disappear, and there is nothing left but the atoms of which the body had been composed. These in their turn are dissipated and disappear, and all has finally been reabsorbed into the general reservoir of forces and atoms. Of the countless millions of human beings who have lived and loved, suffered and rejoiced upon our planet, what is left today to guarantee to us their existence in the past, not to speak of their continuing existence in the present? A few bones, a few buildings, and, later, traces of their historical influence. Later still, we note what they have left behind of beauty in the field of literature, of architecture, of painting, and in those forms in which they have embodied their thought and aspiration, their visions and their ideals. On the planet today we find a humanity at all stages of development, with mechanisms of varying kinds, adequate and inadequate. We find all of them, without exception, breaking down under test and limited by disease, or hiding the seeds of disease, the perfect equipment is totally unknown, and every man harbors the germs of trouble. No man possesses a perfect mechanism, but owns one that must inevitably break down at some point that is conditioned by an underdeveloped or overdeveloped glandular system, that hides at some point inherited disease and racial weaknesses, and that fails somewhere, in some portion of the mechanism, to meet the needs, physical, emotional, and mental, of the day and hour. Of what does this speak? Of the sum total of the united cell life, of the environing group in which a particular form finds itself, of the life, impersonal and abstract in nature, which pervades it, of a vague group spirit that is expressing itself through the fourth kingdom in nature, of a temporary and impermanent self, or of an immortal entity who is the dweller in the body. Such are some of the questions which arise today, and in the last analysis, belief in the soul can be posited as being largely a matter of temperament, of the wish and desire of the ages wherein man struggled and suffered and relieved the strain of living by constructing a body of thought around a happy immortal being, who was to be free, eventually and finally, from all the difficulties of physical existence. 
The soul can be regarded as a beautiful vision or as an hallucination, for all that tends to prove its existence is the testimony of the many mystics down the ages to a contact and an experience which can be accounted for in terms of dream life, of brain lesions or of escape reactions, but which rests on no sure foundation. So say the materialists and the upholders of proven scientific facts. Belief, verbal testimony, hope, curious and inexplicable psychic happenings, the mass of untrained opinion and the findings of visionary people, who were probably psychopathic cases, are not enough to prove the fact of the soul. They prove only man's power to imagine, to build images and pictures, and to lose himself and his dreadful present in a dream world of a possible and ardently desired future in which frustration will end, in which full expression will be achieved, and in which each man will enter into an impossible heritage which he has himself constructed out of the unrealized hopes and dim unuttered longings of his deeply hidden thought life. Belief in God and heaven and in an immortal future have grown out of the ancient awe and ignorant terror of infant humanity. They saw in all the phenomena of nature, incomprehensible and terrifying, the activity of a gigantic man, built on lines which were the projection of their own consciousness, and who could be propitiated or angered by the behavior of a human being. The result of a man's effect upon this deity provided man's destiny, which was either good or bad according to the reactions of this god to his deeds. Thus we have the origin of the heaven or hell complexes of the present religious faiths. From this grew, automatically, the idea of a persistent entity called the soul, which could enjoy heaven or suffer hell at the will of God and as the result of actions done whilst in the human form. As the forms of man grew in sensitivity, as they became more and more refined under the influence of the law of selection and of adaptation, as the group life grew closer and the group integration was improved, as the heritage of history, of tradition and of the arts grew richer and made its impress, so that ideas of God grew, and likewise ideas of the soul and of the world, Man's concepts of reality grew richer and deeper, so that today we are faced with the problem of a thought inheritance which testifies to a world of concepts, ideas and intuitions which deal with the immaterial and the intangible, and which testify to an age-long belief in a soul and its immortality for which there is no true justification. At the same time we have demonstrated to us by science that all we can really know with certainty is the tangible world of phenomena, with its forms, its mechanisms, its test tubes and its laboratories, and the bodies of men, fearfully and wonderfully made, diverse and different. These in some mysterious way produce thoughts and dreams and imaginings, and which, in their turn, find expression in the formulated schemes of the past, the present and the future, or in the fields of literature, art and of science itself, or in the simple everyday life of the ordinary human being who lives and loves and works and plays and bears children and eats food and earns money and sleeps. And then what? Does man disappear into nothingness, or does, somewhere, a part of him, hitherto unseen, live on? Does this aspect survive for a time and then in its turn disappear, or is there an immortal principle, a subtle intangible entity which has an existence either in the body or out of the body, and which is the undying immutable being, belief in whom has sustained countless millions down the ages. Is the soul a fiction of the imagination and has science satisfactorily disproved its existence? Is consciousness a function of the brain and of the allied nervous system, or shall we accept the idea of a conscious dweller in the form? Does our power to become aware of and to react to our surroundings find its source in the body nature, or is there an entity who beholds and takes action? Is this entity different to and separable from the body, or is it the result of the body type and life, and so either persists after the body disappears, or disappears with it and is lost? Is there nothing but matter or energies in constant movement which produce the appearances of men who react in their turn and express the energy that is pouring through them blindly and unconsciously, having no individual existence? Or are all these theories partially true, and shall we really comprehend the nature and being of man only in the synthesis of all of them and in the acceptance of the general premises? Is it not possible that the mechanically minded and scientific investigators are right in their conclusion anent the mechanism and the form nature, and that the spiritually minded thinkers who posit an immortal entity are also right? As yet perhaps something is lacking which would bridge the gap between the two positions. 
Is it possible that we may discover a something which will link the intangible world of true being with the tangible world, so-called of form life? When humanity is assured of divinity and of immortality, and has entered into a state of knowledge as to the nature of the soul and of the kingdom in which that soul functions, its attitude to daily life and to current affairs will undergo such a transformation that we shall verily and indeed see the emergence of a new heaven and a new earth. Once the central entity within each human form is recognized and known for what it essentially is, and once its divine persistence is established, then we shall necessarily see the beginning of the reign of divine law on earth, a law imposed without friction and without rebellion. This beneficent reaction will come about because the thinkers of the race will be blended together in a general soul awareness, and a consequent group consciousness will permit them to see the purpose underlying the working of the law. Let us put this a little more simply. We are told in the New Testament that we must endeavor to let the mind which was in Christ also be manifest in us. We are working towards the perfecting of the rule of Christ on earth. We are aiming at the development of the Christ consciousness and at the bringing in of the rule or law of Christ, which is love. This will come to fruition in the Aquarian Age, and we shall see brotherhood established on earth. The rule of Christ is the dominance of the basic spiritual laws. The mind of Christ is a phrase conveying the concept of the rule of divine intelligent love, which stimulates the rule of the soul within all forms, and brings in the reign of the Spirit. It is not easy to express the nature of the revelation which is on the way. It involves the recognition by men everywhere that the mind stuff, as the Hindus call it, to which their own minds are related and of which their mental bodies are an integral part, is also part of the mind of Christ, the cosmic Christ, of whom the historical Christ is, upon our planet, the ordained representative. When men, through meditation and group service, have developed an awareness of their own controlled and illumined minds, they will find themselves initiated into a consciousness of true being and into a state of knowledge which will prove to them the fact of the soul, beyond all doubt or questioning. The mystery of the ages is on the verge of revelation, and through the revelation of the soul that mystery which it veils will stand revealed. The scriptures of the world, we know, have ever prophesied that at the end of the age we shall see the revelation of that which is secret, and the emergence into the light of day of that which has hitherto been concealed and veiled. This, our present cycle, is the end of the age, and the next two hundred years will see the abolition of death, as we now understand that great transition, and the establishing of the fact of the soul's existence. The soul will be known as an entity, as the motivating impulse and the spiritual center back of all manifested forms. The next few decades will see certain great beliefs substantiated. The work of Christ, and his main mission two thousand years ago, was to demonstrate the divine possibilities and powers latent in every human being. The proclamation which he made to the effect that we were all sons of God and own one universal Father will, in the future, no longer be regarded as a beautiful, mystical and symbolic statement, but will be regarded as a scientific pronouncement. Our universal brotherhood and our essential immortality will be demonstrated and realized to be facts in nature. He came, he said, not to bring peace but a sword, and esoterically, he has been the cosmic divider. Why? Because, in establishing unity, he also makes a distinction between body and soul. Body and soul are, however, only two parts of one whole, and this must not be forgotten. In establishing the fact of the soul and its expression, the body, the totality emerges in completeness. How will this revelation come? We enter here into the realm of foretelling and of prevision to which many have an objection on the ground that the thing of the moment is that which aids the soul's spiritual living. They feel that the holding out of promises of future help and revelation, and the encouragement in the aspirant of a happy speculation and an idle expectancy carry the seeds of danger, of static inertia, and of idle imaginings. But, where there is no vision, the people perish, and so much has happened during the last two hundred years, and so much has already been revealed, that we are provided with a firm basis for all our forward-looking. Had the unfoldments of the nineteenth and twentieth centuries, in the departments of science and psychology alone, been forecast to the thinkers of the world in the sixteenth century, how strange and impossible it would all have seemed to them. 
Stranger than anything I might hear prophecy to you, for we have already seen so much occur, and the testimony to the world of true being is accumulating so fast, that we can no longer stand amazed at any occurrence. The fact of the soul will be brought to the racial recognition in many ways, and the revelation will come along so many lines that all types of minds will be satisfied. I shall indicate only a few. The psychics of the world are increasing greatly in number, and the growing sensitivity of the race to impression is a cause of rejoicing and of danger. All over the world aspirants are registering contacts hitherto unknown, are seeing a phenomenal world usually hidden to them, and are generally becoming aware of an expansion of consciousness. They are registering a world of phenomena, often astral, sometimes mental, and occasionally egoic which does initiate them into a new dimension of consciousness and into a different state of being. This expansion of consciousness serves both to encourage them in their endeavor and to complicate the way of the aspirant. This growing sensitivity is universal, hence the rapid growth of spiritualism and of the psychic sciences, and hence also the increase among men of nervous tension, of neurotic conditions, and of the greatly increased problems of the psychiatrist, hence also the spread of new nervous and mental diseases. This sensitivity is the response of the mechanism of man to the approaching developments, and the race as a whole is being brought into a condition wherein it will be ready to see and hear that which has been up to the present unrevealed. The growth of the color sense and the capacity to respond musically to quarter tones and subtle nuances indicate a thinning of the veil which separates the world of external and tangible phenomena from that of subjective being and of more subtle matter. The growth also of etheric vision and the largely increased numbers of clairvoyant and clairaudient people are steadily revealing the existence of the astral plane and the etheric counterpart of the physical world. More and more people are becoming aware of this subjective realm. They see people walking around who are either the so-called dead, or who in sleep have dropped the physical sheath. They become aware of colors and distinctive hues and streams of organized light which are not of this physical world. They hear sounds and voices which emanate from those who are not using the physical vocal apparatus, and from forms of existence which are not corporeal. The first step toward substantiating the fact of the soul is to establish the fact of survival, though this may not necessarily prove the fact of immortality. It can nevertheless be regarded as a step in the right direction. That something survives the process of death, and that something persists after the disintegration of the physical body, is steadily being proved. If that is not so, then we are the victims of a collective hallucination, and the brains and minds of thousands of people are untrue and deceiving, are diseased and distorted. Such a gigantic collective insanity is more difficult to credit than the alternative of an expanded consciousness. This development along psychic lines does not prove the fact of the soul, however, it only serves to break down the materialistic position. It is among the thinkers of the race that the first assured recognition of the soul will come, and this event will be the result of the study and analysis, by the psychologists of the world, of the nature of genius and the significance of creative work. Some men and women in the world tower above their fellow men, and produce that which is superlative in its own field. Their work has in it the element of divinity and of immortality. The work of creative artists, the intuitive perception of great scientific investigators, the inspired imagination of the poets of the world and the vision of the illumined idealists, have all to be accounted for and explained, for the laws under which such men and women work have yet to be discovered. The close study, by the psychologist, of the abnormal and the subnormal, of warped and distorted minds and of defective equipments, has been overemphasized, and due attention has not been given to the divinely abnormal, and to those types of consciousness which transcend the ordinary human state of intelligent awareness. These latter supernormal states find expression through the medium of the great artists, musicians, dramatists, writers, and the many other types of creative workers who have been the glory of the human kingdom down the ages, and who will flame forth during the coming century with greater glory still. When the hypothesis of the soul is accepted, when the nature of the spiritual energy which flows through the soul is admitted, and when the mechanism of the force centers is studied, we shall make rapid progress towards knowledge. 
When, through meditation, experiment is made to produce creatively some of the beauty contacted, some of the ideas revealed and some of the patterns seen, we shall learn to cultivate genius and understand how to train people to work creatively. Then much will be discovered about the centers in man where the divine principle has its dwelling, and from which the Christ within can work. The study of the superconscious must be undertaken, and not simply the study of the self-conscious or of the subconscious. Through this study, carried forward with an open mind, modern psychology will eventually arrive at a recognition of the soul. The range of investigation is so wide that I can only indicate some of the possible fields of research. 1. The investigation of the nature of genius, and its definite and specialized cultivation. 2. Training in creative work and a study of the difference between this kind of training and training for vocational work. Creative work proves the fact of the soul. Vocational training demonstrates the type of the personality. 3. Scientific investigation of the powers in man, with particular attention to telepathy. It will be found that telepathic work is from mind to mind, or from soul to mind, and does not necessarily imply brain-to-brain -brain communication and contact. This is one of the most promising fields of investigation, though it still presents much difficulty. The fact of the existence of the soul will not be proved through the medium of telepathy until after the year 1945. By that time an event will have happened in the world and a particular new teaching will have been given which will put the entire subject of telepathic phenomena in a new light. 4. The scientific training of clairvoyance and the intelligent development of clairvoyant powers by the intelligentsia of the world leaves as yet much to be desired, but it will come as the result of mind control and illumination. Men will learn to subject the mechanism of the body to a downflow of spiritual energy and stimulation, and thus will bring the powers of the psychic nature into activity, and the old method of sitting for development in order to awaken the centers will be seen as dangerous and unnecessary. In the field of modern psychology we can look for a gradual recognition of the fact of the self. The problem of the psychologists is to comprehend the relationship or the identity of that self with the soul. It is, however, from the field of science that the greatest help will come. The fact of the soul will eventually be proved through the study of light and of radiation and through a coming evolution in particles of light. Through this imminent development we shall find ourselves seeing more and penetrating deeper into that which we see today. One of the recognized facts in the realm of natural science has been the cyclic change in the fauna and flora of our planet. Animals, plentiful and familiar many thousands of years ago, are now extinct, and by means of their bones we endeavor to reconstruct their forms. Flowers and trees that once covered the surface of our planet have now entirely disappeared and only their fossilized remains are left to indicate to us a vegetation vastly different to that which we now enjoy. Man himself has changed so much that we find it difficult to recognize Homo sapiens in the early primitive races of the far distant past. This mutability and obliteration of earlier types is due to a major factor among many. The quality of the light which promotes and nurtures growth, vitality and fertility in the kingdoms of nature has changed several times during the ages, and as it has changed it has produced corresponding mutations in the phenomenal world. From the standpoint of the esotericist, all forms of life on our planet are affected by three types of light substance, and at the present time a fourth type is gradually making its presence felt. These types of light are 1. The light of the sun 2. The light in the planet itself, not the reflected light of the sun but its own inherent radiance 3. A light seeping in, if I may use such a phrase, from the astral plane, a steady and gradual penetration of the astral light, and its fusion with the other two types of radiance 4. A light which is beginning to merge itself with the other three types and which comes from that state of matter which we call the mental plane, a light in its turn reflected from the realm of the soul. An intensification of the light is going on all the time, and this increase in intensity began on the earth at about the time when man discovered the uses of electricity, which discovery was a direct result of this intensification. 
The electrification of the planet through the widespread use of electricity is one of the things which is inaugurating the new age, and which will aid in bringing about the revelation of the presence of the soul. Before long this intensification will become so great that it will materially assist in the rending of the veil which separates the astral plane from the physical plane. The dividing etheric web will shortly be dissipated, and this will permit a more rapid inflow of the third aspect of light. The light from the astral plane, a starry radiance, and the light of the planet itself will be more closely blended, and the result upon humanity and upon the three other kingdoms in nature cannot be overemphasized. It will, for one thing, profoundly affect the human eye and make the present sporadic etheric vision a universal asset. It will bring within the radius of our range of contact the infrared and ultraviolet gamut of colors, and we shall see what at present is hidden. All this will tend to destroy the platform upon which the materialists stand, and to pave the way, first, for the admission of the soul as a sound hypothesis, and secondly, for the demonstration of its existence. We only need more light, in the esoteric sense, in order to see the soul, and that light will shortly be available and we shall understand the meaning of the words, and in thy light shall we see light. This intensification of the light will continue until AD 2025, when there will come a cycle of relative stability and of steady shining without much augmentation. In the second decanate of Aquarius these three aspects will again be augmented by increased light from the fourth aspect, that is the light from the soul realm, reaching us via the universal, chitta, or mind stuff. This will flood the world. By that time, however, the soul will be recognized as a fact, and as a consequence of this recognition our entire civilization will have changed so radically that we cannot today even guess at the form it will take. The next ten years will see a greatly increased merging of the first three forms of light, and those of you who are awake to these issues and happenings will find it interesting to note what is going on. The consensus of opinion in the religious and spiritualistic fields and in the field of biblical prophecy, and likewise a study of the symbolism of the pyramid, lead students to believe that the immediate future will see some great event and some unforeseen spiritual happening. This should be duly anticipated, and careful preparation should be made for it. I refer not to any coming of any individual. I refer to a natural process with far-reaching effects. There are certain other fields of activity which will all do their part in demonstrating the fact of the soul. There is an aspect of human consciousness which has for long baffled the materialistic psychologist, and this is the curious power of prevision, the ability to foresee and foretell with accuracy events coming in the immediate future, or distant happenings. There are warnings given by some inner monitor which have again and again saved man from death and disaster, there are the appearances, to their friends and relatives, of men or women who have just died, before any word of their death has been received. This is not in the field of telepathic knowledge of the death, but involves the appearance of the person. There is the power to participate in events in distant places and to recover the recollection of what transpired with accuracy as to place, personnel and detail. These powers and many similar previsions and recognitions have long bewildered investigators and must find correct explanation. In their wise investigation, in the accumulation of responsible evidence, and in the later substantiation of the prevision, it will begin to be seen that some factor exists in man which is not bound by spacetime limitations, but which transcends the normal human consciousness. The present attempted investigation and explanations are inadequate and do not account satisfactorily for all the facts. When, however, they are approached from the standpoint of the soul, with its faculty of omniscience and its freedom from categories of past, present and future, for they are lost in the consciousness of the eternal now, we shall begin to understand the process a little more clearly. When the true dweller in the body is recognized and the laws of prevision are discovered, and when the power to foresee is generally prevalent, then we shall begin to find ample proof of the existence of the soul. It will be impossible to account for the ordinary phenomena then current without admitting its existence. Along these various lines proof of the soul will accumulate. In the massing of testimony and of evidence a fruitful field of activity lies. In the training of the higher types of men in the use of the soul force and soul powers, and in the trained control of the mechanism, 
that evidence so produced will be seen to be of so high an order and will be so scientifically presented that it will be regarded as of as much importance and as justifiable as any views presented by our leading scientists in their various fields of research today. The study of the soul will before long be as legitimate and respectable an investigation as any scientific problem, such as research into the nature of the atom. The investigation of the soul and its governing laws will, before long, engross the attention of our finest minds. The newer psychology will eventually succeed in proving the fact of its existence, and the paralleling intuitive and instinctive response of mankind to soul nurture, emanating from the invisible side of life, will steadily and successfully prove the existence of a spiritual entity in man, an entity all-wise, immortal, divine and creative. But the process would be slow were it not for the work now being done by a group of disciples, and initiates working in collaboration with the Master P, who has his headquarters in America and who, with his disciples, is doing much to stimulate the various psychological schools in the world today. It is needless for students to endeavor to ascertain his identity. He works through movements and schools of thought, and does no work with private individuals. He works practically entirely on the mental plane, with the power of thought, and is quite unknown and unrecognized, except by his fellow workers in the various countries in the world, and by the disciples on his ray, the fourth ray. Much that is opening in the world of psychology today is due to the work he does in stimulating the minds of the leaders of movements. He works with them on the mental plane, but does not contact them as physical plane individuals. The urgency of the time is great, and the masters are exceedingly active and profoundly concerned at this time with the work of salvaging the world. They have not the time for personal work, except with their own groups of accepted cellas, all of whom are active in the world work, or they would not be in the master's group. Also they may work intermittently with small groups of probationers to whom they offer opportunity and give an occasional hint. Each of them has a few, a very few, probationers in training, to take the place of cellas who pass on to initiation, but beyond these two groups, during this century, they do no personal work, leaving the many aspirants to the care of lesser initiates and cellas. Even their work and their personal cellas at this time are much restricted, and word has been sent out to the working disciples in the world to stand on their own feet, to use their own judgment and not handicap the masters at this time of intense strain and danger by attracting their attention needlessly. The world issues today are of such importance, and the opportunity before humanity is so great, and the masters are so entirely occupied with world affairs and with the dominant and prominent figures in high places in the nations, that the instruction of unimportant people in the various little occult groups and societies is temporarily suspended. The time is relatively so short in which to accomplish and carry out certain aspects of the plan as entrusted to the Great Ones, that all true cellas are going about their work and endeavoring to solve their own problems without having to call on the Master's help, thus leaving him free for more important work. The closer a disciple is to a Master, the more deeply he realizes this fact, and the more he endeavors to fulfill his duty, learn his lessons, serve humanity, and lift some of the load of work off the shoulders of the Master. The world today is full of disciples of varying degree, and each of them is, in his place, able to guide and help some aspirants. The world is full of teaching and of books able to inspire and help all true seekers after spiritual knowledge. The last fifty years have seen much teaching given out and much esoteric training given to the world and available now to all who earnestly seek it. Aspirants have much to work upon and much theory to render into practice, and this leaves the masters free for more important work. One of the interesting things that is happening, and one of the factors which will serve eventually in the work of demonstrating the fact of the soul, is the mass of communications inspired writings and telepathic dictations which is flooding the world today. As you know, the spiritualistic movement is producing a vast amount of this inspired or pseudo-inspired literature, some of it of the very highest order and unquestionably the work of highly evolved disciples, and some of it most mediocre in quality. The various theosophical societies have been the recipients of similar communications, and they are found in every occult group. True communications are frequently of deep spiritual value, and contain much teaching and help for the aspirant. 
students of the times would do well to remember that it is the teaching that is of moment, not the supposed source, by their intrinsic value alone these writings and communications must be judged. These communications emanate in the majority of instances from the soul plane, and the recipient or the communicator, the intermediary or scribe, is either inspired by his own soul or has tapped the thought level and knowledge of the ray group to which his soul belongs. He tunes in on a reservoir of thought, and his mind and brain translate these thoughts into words and phrases. In a lesser number of cases, the man who is receiving a dictation or writing is in telepathic rapport with some more advanced disciple than himself, and his mind is being impressed by some chela in his group. This chela, who is closer to the master than he is, passes on to him some of the knowledge that he has absorbed through being able to live within the master's aura. But the master is not concerned in the process, it lies between the chela and the aspirant. In these cases the receiver of the communication is often misled, and thinks that the master himself is dictating to him, whereas in reality he has, through a more advanced chela than himself, tuned in on the master's thought atmosphere. None of the masters of the sixth initiation, such as the masters M and KH, are at this time working through dictation with their disciples. They are too much engrossed with world problems, and with the work of watching over the destinies of the prominent world figures in the various nations, to have any opportunity to dictate teaching to any particular disciple in some small field of activity and upon subjects of which sufficient is already known to enable the disciple to go ahead alone and unaided. Two of the masters are working telepathically and through dictation with several accepted disciples, and their effort is to inspire these disciples, who are active in world work, to greater usefulness in the plan. They are working in this way in order to impress a few of the prominent thinkers in the field of science and of social welfare with the needed knowledge which will enable them to make the right moves in the emergence of the race into greater freedom. But I know of no others, in this particular generation, who are so doing, for they have delegated much of this work to their initiates and disciples. The bulk of the communicators today, working through aspirants on the physical plane, are active working chelas of accepted degree who, living as they do in the thought aura of the master and his group, are steadily endeavoring to reach all kinds of people, all over the world, in all groups. Hence the increasing flood of communications, of inspired writings, and of personal messages and teaching. When you add to the above the equally large flood of communications which emanate from the transmitter's own souls and from the realm of the subconscious, you have accounted for the mass of the material going out now. In all this there is need for deep thankfulness at the growing responsiveness and sensitivity of man. That the first reaction and effect of such an outpouring of communications is often increase of spiritual pride and ambition, and that the stepping down of the teaching from the mind to the brain and from the brain into words and sentences often fails in adequacy is sadly true, and that there is frequently misapprehension as to the emanating source of the instructions is also true, for the lack of humility in man and the lack of a true sense of proportion are great. But out of this inflow from the subjective side of life are coming new knowledge, increased devotion to the plan, and those indications which will eventually bring us assurance. Men will know, and know soon, that the soul is not an imaginary fiction, that it is not just a symbolic way of expressing a deep-seated hope, and is not man's method of building a defense mechanism, nor is it an illusory way of escape from a distressing present. They will know that the soul is a being, a being that is responsible for all that appears upon the phenomenal plane. <laughs>